Welcome to the Washdown Podcast, and this is episode 146, um, first one we shot in 2024, and our guest is Brian Now What Minnick. Uh, Brian was a Navy veteran, a uh, firefighter. Um, look, I'm not going to get into too deep into his bio. We go pretty deep in it on the podcast. Um, he is starting his own podcast and writing his own autobiography, which uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and say it's going to be a must read. So um, here's episode 146 of the Washdown podcast with Brian Now What Minnick. Crew standby for emergency traffic. All crews standby for emergency traffic. That's the unit with the meeting. Go ahead with your traffic. It's nothing's changed. Nothing, not a fucking <laughs> thing. How can I create more work for Jeremy today? <laughs> Holy crap! <laughs> oh man. Well, yeah. I I don't know. Just by showing up, you create a shit ton of work all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine though. I'm glad you're back, James. <laughs> I'm I'm glad you've decided to grace us with your presence. I uh I didn't get the um fanfare and confetti like I thought I would. Um well, so we just had the house cleaned and I didn't feel like trying to clean up confetti. So That's fair. You, you could know. have at least got the marching band. Uh you know what? They disbanded. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, budget, budget cuts budget cuts man <laughs> it's uh you know inflation and all that shit <laughs> so anyway brian hello <laughs> jeremy how you been uh i can't complain man can't complain that's awesome so, how about you how about you what have you been up to um i've been up to a whole lot of nothing uh lately uh that's not really true but uh Last time I saw you in person, we sat at a coffee shop uh, almost two years ago, and, and we went over the gear list, as you as you said earlier, yep. um, about doing my own podcast. Um, so uh, I bought all that equipment the following week, and it's still in the boxes down in my basement today. <laughs> um, been dealing with some avoidance issues, I think, and some uh, came, came across that. So yeah, it's been great. Um, but uh, I'm looking to have uh, a catalyst kick in here and... Uh, and kick me in the rear in here. 2024 is going to be the year it gets uh, gets started. and Gets done. And uh, the book's going to be finished in this year. It's my goal. Um, it's been uh, kind of a tough thing to do, but here we go. I mean, I don't know how I want to start this off, but, you know, we're in a kind well, of banner. But, so you know. why, why don't you just start by uh, basically just kind of giving everybody the, the 50,000-foot version <laughs> of uh, who Brian Minnick is, and um, then we can uh, lead into uh, – you know, the whole book and the gotcha. podcast and awesome. uh, all awesome. that stuff. Um, well, Brian Minnick is, uh, um, well, a lot of people probably think he's a, uh, an asshole. <laughs> um, uh, I had, uh, um, I joke about that a little bit. Uh, on all honesty, uh, uh, I'm a, a resident of the Midwest here in the Kansas City area. I've, I grew up here, um, started my life out uh, in Kentucky because my father was a drill instructor uh, in the army and he did two tours in Vietnam prior to that and, um, was the original source of, uh, trauma in my life. I came to find out later on. You um, mean a Vietnam veteran who was a drill instructor? <laughs> yeah. And he was, was there, he was there during the Tet Offensive, Aishaw Valley, Doc Toe. He was with the 173rd, um, airborne and they, they called him the third herd. Um, the reason why they called him that is because they let him off to the slaughter and, and he had a lot of survivor's guilt, a lot of PTSD and, uh, of course, you know, we didn't address it as PTSD back in the 70s when I was growing up. Right. Um, it was, I think, they called it shell shock or something like that back in the military. Um, I'm a veteran as well. I'm a Navy veteran. Um, my, my old man wouldn't uh, sign for me to join the Marine Corps like I wanted to before I was 18. Um, he didn't want to see me do combat. And uh, I was so gung-ho to get out of here. Um, I went ahead and went to the next office over, and they said they had uh, gave me a test, an uh, ASVAB test, and said, well, uh, firefighting is really a pretty big deal for you. You qualify for that. And come to find out it's because uh, damage control, which what I was, a damage controlman in the Navy, the uh, uh, rate had just reopened again, and they needed to fill bodies in it. And um, Do you but, mean the recruiter kind of lied to yeah, you a yeah, little bit? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't like I was that smart. <laughs> you know, not that you have to be that smart to drag hoses, but um, yeah. Hey, it was, hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hey, it's a luxury, man. Um, nah, but honestly, uh 
uh, I was, uh, as I write about in my book, um, my childhood was spent um, a lot of times at the uh, one of the main fire stations down in my neighborhood. Um, I'm going to refrain from, as I know you do on your podcast, but I've done this in my book, is writing my book, refraining from uh, uh, naming departments or naming names of people, um, changing names if I, if I need to. Because um, I'm writing a book and telling a story about my life, about what I experienced. And um, the title of the book is uh, Now What? And just like you see on my hat brim, um, Now What is a, a road name that was given to me. I'm a member of a motorcycle club that is an official MC, but we are a firefighters motorcycle club and um, um, full of EMS and firefighters. Um, it's one of those things when people hear about motorcycle clubs, they think of uh, Hell's Angels, things like that. Um, we are uh, a motorcycle club, an official MC, but we are not a 1% MC. So we we just ride our bikes and we're pretty neutral with everything. And, and we're not a gang or anything like that. So it's just a bunch of guys who are like a brotherhood within the brotherhood. And when I was going through a lot of stuff at one point in my life, which we'll get into here in a little bit, I think, um, I was always calling up my uh, my brothers in the brotherhood and for a little bit of help, advice, cr- shoulder to cry on. And uh, it got periodically um, every year or every six months, something pretty tragic was happening in my life for several years in a row. And so when the phone would ring, my, my caller ID came up on the other end. My, um, a couple of my friends were like, now what? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so when it came time to give me my name, you know, um, they're like, yeah, you've been the most unlucky son of a gun we've known for a long time, but we're, we're going to call you now what? <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> Great. Uh, that's awesome. I always want to be that guy, you know, who, who, you know. Yeah. You know, you <laughs> and that's know. typical of our culture. What's the shittiest thing that's happened to you? All right, let's make sure you remember it forever. It, right. Yeah. Right. Well, well, you well, know, if they don't like you, they don't fuck with you, right? So yeah. everybody loves me. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, and that, that's the thing, though, whenever you look at the, the military and the first responder world, it's the same for both. Right. That's how you get your nickname. Right. If you right. end up getting one is for something that you did that maybe wasn't the smartest thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. There was a, another one that was uh, on the voting list. Uh, uh, got to a gathering, had a gathering with a bunch of people and uh, may have been a little of alcohol involved. Um, all at a hotel, all, nobody driving or doing anything like that. We were all being responsible. But uh, got into a subject matter of uh, a former girlfriend of mine who had been on a dating site. And I said, well, she had told me, I was in a conversation with another person about, well, she had told me that, hey, I get a lot of, uh, like, I joined the site. Within an hour, I had almost 100 emails. And out of those 100 emails, the 98% of them were of somebody's genitalia. <laughs> Not, hi, how are you? Here's a picture of my. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like. Typical. Yeah. So uh, as I was talking about that, one of the other obviously fun firefighters or, oh, did you just say you like those kinds of things? You like dick pics? Is that, is that what it is? You like dick pics? I'm like, no, that's not what I said. <laughs> and of course, well, I think his name's going to be dick pic. Yeah, we should. No, <laughs> no, dude, I don't need dick pic for a name, right? Oh, we'll call it DKPK. It'd be all right. I'm like, no. Nah. So that, that obviously at the time I was employed at a, uh, uh, a major uh, fire department in the metropolitan area and, uh, oh, sort of looked upon higher hootie tooty, I guess, um, atmosphere. And it wouldn't have gone well if I'd had something like that on my, my vest with my name on social media or anything like that. And I just want to have to deal with the hassle of trying to edit every picture or thing. So they went ahead and went with now what? Yeah. So now what though? Um, God, I didn't want to be that guy, you know, you know, you're like, you know, um, it kind of bothered me a lot. And, and I lived with it though. And a couple of years uh, after I'd gotten it, I was uh, at a at a gathering with another um, guy of mine, friend of mine, and he was like, "What's up, man?" I was like, "Ah, just not really digging my road name, man." You know, <laughs> he's like, "Yeah, I get." It. He goes, "But here, look at it this way, Brian." He goes, "He's a brother of mine in the club." He goes, "Why don't you look at it like this? You know, now what's what are you gonna do next? You know, now what's what's gonna what now what from here, man? You know, up. You know, let's 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 just move on up." And I was like, "All right, thank you. All right." But then um, um, when I ended up in a facility called the Center of Excellence, which we're going to talk about, um, that saved my life. Um, the Center of Excellence is a, a facility for um, International Association of Firefighters members, um, for firefighters who are in distress, 
um, dealing with uh, drug addiction, alcoholism, and PTSD and whatnot. It's uh, located in Upper Marlboro, Maryland, and I spent 43 days there in inpatient. And uh, while I was there, um, one of the counselors, we were having a group counseling session, and one of the counselors said to all of us in the room, spouting off about, you know, the things we've done and been through, and then she said, now what are you going to do? And it just hit me. I took it in my book. I was writing in my book, you know, taking notes every day. And I wrote it down. Now what? That's going to be the name of my book. Now what? That's what's going to be the name of my podcast, you know, because I'd been in for a few weeks at that point, And I started to think, what am I going to do with myself? How am I going to, how am I going to keep this therapy going? You know, yeah. um, so those are the ideas I had. Well, then I embraced the, the name. And then that's when I started kind of, uh, I guess. I'm sort of uh, branding myself that way now because um, that's what the podcast is going to be called. And that's what the book's going to be called. And the title of the book is Now What? A, um, I Couldn't Make This Shit Up If I Tried, um, A First Responder Story of Resiliency by Brian K. Minnick. Cool. Well, so. I can't wait, to, can't wait to read it once you get it finished. Right, so, right. <laughs> but you know what? I mean, it's, that is something that a lot of people that wants their – out of the career field, whether voluntary or involuntary, um, they struggle with. Right. It's that separation and now what am I? Right. What am I supposed to do with the rest of my life? Right. And so. Yeah, I mean, yeah, as dude. you see, I mean, I've, I've got it adorned in my skin. Um, and I didn't even get my first firefighter tattoo till after I was a fireman for about five years. And uh, um, it's just, it, it's, it's uh, as you well know, um, it's a calling. It's, it's a. Uh, we're not doing it for the money. <laughs> Definitely not a lot of money there. <laughs> um, it can be, I guess, if you live at the fire station and work there every day and work a lot of overtime and don't have your own house or something, I guess, for a couple of years or something. You might be able to be lucrative, make more than a deputy chief or something. But I, yeah. I, don't, I don't know if I've heard that story somewhere. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, it, it's it's definitely a calling, man. And, and um, that kind of gets me to uh, um, where I was at. Um, um, kind of a, the 50,000-foot... I guess uh, cliff notes would be um, I was married for 22 years officially. Um, I lost my wife <laughs> to cancer. <laughs> uh, it still hurts. <laughs> yeah. Take take a breath, man. Yeah, cool. It's it's, uh, it's fine. That, that stuff is uh, <laughs> it's hard to talk about. I um, get it. This is the very first time I've speaking publicly about all of this stuff. And, um, uh, I had to be, it had to be now. Um, and, and it couldn't have been two years ago. It couldn't have been three years ago or four years ago. It, it's finally now things are where they're supposed to be. Um, I've come to find that out, but, uh, um, married 22 years, um, together, 25 years, um, residing together roughly. That's why I just tell people I was married 25 years. Um, newer, met her in high school, um, newer 30 years. Um, uh, love my life. And uh, great mother to my children, our two children we had together. I was married once before, um, briefly, uh, which wonderful woman there, um, a mother of my oldest daughter. And, you know, we were young and things went a different route. That's all, all the details of that kind of stuff will be in my book as well. But um, here I am saying I'm a lot. Uh, <laughs> uh, so she, she, Contract. I get in fire service finally, and then um, things life's going good. But then she gets diagnosed a year and a half later with cancer, and um, I had gotten in fire service later in life on my second attempt to get in fire service because, as I was telling you before, I was a damage control in the Navy. Well, I joined the Navy when I was seventeen and I turned eighteen in boot camp. I was twenty one when I grad when I was uh, discharged from Navy, and whenever I was um, going for different jobs after Navy, I was I was trying to apply for police department and fire departments because I was looking for a career. That would have a uh, good benefit um, and and, and uh, retirement pro program. So um, I applied everywhere, man. Um, applied everywhere and uh, got on put on waiting lists. And this is 1993, 94, 95. Yeah, um, so it was. It's a super area. hard Dude, to was, get hired then. They were like they'd have positions open, and there'd be like 300 guys for two or three positions available. Yeah. Um, I remember one time in uh, one of the the cities that we have where most of our uh, uh, pro athletes live. Um, I was applying for that particular department. And I remember asking the uh, 
gentleman who was the proctor of the testing and stuff, um, if we get a job here, do we have to live here? Is there a residency clause? He goes, son, <laughs> if you work in this town, you don't live in this town. <laughs> I'm like, all right, cool. Fair um, enough. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, tried getting on several different departments. Um, one of our, uh, the two big boys in this region, um, I was on the western side of the state line, uh, tried for them three, three, four different times on, on uh, the fourth occasion I was trying. There was a uh, young female, um, of a minority female. Um, she could not, she was quite petite too. Um, and we watched them and watched back then. They didn't have the fancy dummies, you know, dragging old Johnny down the, mm-hmm. you know, um, they had duffel bags. And so pulling at the, uh, 60 feet and 60 feet back, six, 70 or 60 feet, whatever it was back and forth. Um, we just dragged it. And as we're watching, we're done. We're ahead of her. She's not able to pull it. So we watched them help her pull it and just found that really odd. And it was okay. So me and about a handful of other guys, and we left. And about three months later, I'm going down the road in this particular town and uh, see an open – back then they had open cabs, um, fire engines. And there she was facing backwards in uniform and whew, threw my hands up in the air, man. I was I was 24 at the time and just like done. I was like giving up like a fool because that was a very foolish thing for me to do. But that was also because of my anger because I, I had anger issues at that point and I would get to learn why. But – uh. Yeah, so I gave up and uh, just continued in the uh, construction business. I was a fire sprinkle industry, welding fire mains for a um, major company here in, in the metro area. Did that for seven years, almost eight. Then uh, left there and went into construction, doing building, uh, working on the sprint project that we had here, uh, complex in our town. And then uh, met a person there who talked to me about um, doing uh college you know my gi bill use my gi bill and i was like all right you know and i went up to the college um and talked to them about it and they kind of took me by the hand man and and i got enrolled in all these graphic design courses because i've been a a naturally gifted artist my whole life and i figured what the heck at that time man i mean they can make some good money you know and and get out of welding and breathing breathing these gases and getting color blinded and stuff over time (laughs) so that's not good for an artist but um so anyway i I did my construction and I went, I went to college and then, um, I quit my job and just went to college full time using my GI bill money to help supplement some of the bills. And I still took student loans out to pay my stuff, but, um, took four years to get a three or two year degree. And 2004, I, I got my, uh, communication design degree from our local hoity toity, uh, junior college here. <laughs> so, um, great college, great college. In fact, it should be a university, but um, don't want to lose that county money. So that county money is pretty lucrative for that 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 facility. But um, so I did that, and uh, the short time, what, four years is not really a long time. Um, in that time, the industry warranted about fifty to seventy five thousand dollar a year job for a graphic designer. Well, by the time two thousand four came around, when I was graduating. During uh, those four years, YouTube came out really heavily, and pirated software came out. <laughs> and next thing you know, yeah. we've got a bunch of high school kids um, getting out of high school, working for coming into the industry and applying for jobs and showing their portfolios that they've produced themselves. Mm-hmm. And here I am with a $40,000 college bill and, and four years of my life invested, hoping to get a job that I can start making some decent money at, and you can't make thirty five grand. Yeah. You know, a year. And by the time you start getting up to a certain point, they just lay you off and hire in a new guy, you know. Yeah. I works. know so many people with graphic design degrees that never even worked in the field because they couldn't get a job, couldn't right. get their foot in the door. Right. Yeah. And then, uh, so what was I was left to do was freelance. So here I was freelancing artwork and doing and working for a um, one of the three or four companies I worked for there in those seven, eight years. Um. And I was working 120, 150 hours a week. You know, I mean, I wasn't, I was, my wife and I were just ships in the night, <laughs> you know, got to see each other on weekends if we were lucky and uh, just burning the can at both ends. And man, did I gain some weight eating all my freaking, <laughs> you know, deal, eating food, eating water and all that. Um, but uh, probably eating your feelings a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I eat my feelings. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then so uh, um, what had happened was back when I was trying for that job, 
and gave up because of the um, minority female who got hired over us. Now, when I say about that, when I talk about that, it's a touchy subject because I'm, I'm half Hispanic. I'm, I'm half Hispanic myself. So I guess I fall into the minority category. But when this job, this job, I don't care what color you are, what creed you are, what religion you are. I don't care your sexual preference. I don't care. I just want to make sure you go home, and I want you to make sure I go home, just like in the military. You know, um, we're there for each other when it comes down to it. And so affirmative action um, is something I learned about back in when I was in the Navy, in fact, before I got out. Um, in the Navy, um, I'd taken my E5 exam twice, and I had, they had done what was called PNA, which is pass but not advanced. And that basically means that you pass the test. Um, there's only so many positions open right now for that rank and so we're going to take the most senior guys who had more time in grade or guys who had more awards or medals or whatnot for points. Mm -hmm. And um, I had taken um, and made a good friend of mine. I'll call him K-Man like I do in the book. And K-Man and I, um, we'd studied the test together and all that. And he was a black guy and a um, real good buddy of mine. And we studied and studied and we took the test and got the results back and we both scored the same. And he got the frock, and I didn't. We had the same time in service, too, because we both joined the same month and same year. Well, I had ESWAS. ESWAS is Enlisted Surface Warfare Specialist, and that's a, that's a pin. Kind of like if you want to compare it to what most people would be familiar with. In the Army, you have jump wings for guys who jump out of airplanes and airborne or special forces and all that stuff, have their own pins and things like that. Well, in the Navy, Enlisted Surface Warfare has one, and there's an air warfare one for the aviation side of things. And it's a, a test you take after a year's worth of um, standing every position on the ship. So I worked in the laundry. I steered the ship. I worked in engineering. I did everything. I, I went and got qualified on every position in the ship. And the reason for that is because if you have more you know, enlisted surface warfare specialists, if you take a hit in combat, and God forbid, and you lose a section of personnel, you should be able to go and man those stations and right. be able to keep the ship going. Yeah. So. But anyway, um, I had that, and it was two extra points. And he looked at me and said, man, you should have got your bird. You know, you should have got frocked. And I was like, well, okay. And another sailor said, it's that affirmative action. What would you put down for your race? I said, well, back then, man, in the 80s when I joined the Navy, there was only two. And, and it was even Negro for, for the African American, you know, back then. And then there was Hispanic. Um, and then there was Caucasian. And that was it. And I don't even think Asian was on there yet. And you know how today in the applications, they'll have subcategories of, of what mm -hmm. your ethnicity is. <laughs> like 14 different ones. Oh right. <laughs> it's like, okay. So, and because I grew up um, with Minnick for the last name, it's Dutch German, and um, my dad was white, I just always considered myself Caucasian. So I put Caucasian down for everything. And uh, they said, that's you need to change, man. You need to change. And I was like, whatever. I, I didn't agree with it because, again, I don't agree with somebody's getting uh, – because of their sex or their race or their religion or whatever, everybody, it's an equal playing field, man. Just earn it, you know, and prove that you really want this job. So um, my first application was at the east side of the state line, um, Major Metropolitan Police Department. And desk sergeant, when I handed him the application, he said, oh, what kind of name is Manic? I said, it's Dutch German. He goes, you don't look Dutch German because it was summertime. I was, I was a little tan. <laughs> you know, so I was like, well, I'm, I'm half Mexican. My mom's Gonzalez. He scratched out the C and put an H and said, that makes a hell of a difference, son. I mean, I'm, I'm 21 years old at the time. All right, whatever. <laughs> now, fast forward 13 years or 12 or 13 years, and I'm trying to apply for fire departments at the age of 38, 39. I'm putting H on everything. I'm playing the game. Um, so uh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, Dude, we've talked about that so much on this on this podcast. Of you know, there are certain things that it really you do everybody in those career fields a disservice by doing that, right? Is because these are life and death jobs, mm -hmm. and it shouldn't matter what, like you said, race, sex, cre anything. It's right. can and can and will. Right. Can you do the job, and will you do the job? Right. And if you can't. Or you won't, then go do something else, you know? And, too, I think we forget sometimes that, like, it hurts those of us that are minorities when we actually can and will do the job 
the the stigma that we just got hired for our physical characteristics that we have exactly. no control over. Exactly. Yeah. Being being a black man here off camera. Right. <laughs> Everybody knows who you are, James. You've been in front of the camera at least once. But you know, it's it, it hurts everybody equally. There you know, it's just it's something we don't take the time haven't taken the time to think about in the past. Yeah. Well, well and even the great Martin Luther King, man, and his speech, if you actually I've actually read his I Have a Dream speech and it's a moving speech. If you have never actually read the whole thing, please do because it is a remarkable speech. But, you know, judges for our the content of our character, you know, and that's the whole deal. You have to have integrity and character to do this job, let alone, you know, any other job. Yeah. Well, and I saw an interview with Morgan Freeman from, fuck, I don't know, the late 90s maybe. Right. And it was a 60-minute deal, and the reporter or whatever was talking to him about Black History Month. And he's like, no, I don't want a Black History Month. He goes, I'm an American. It's, that's got right. nothing to do with it. Right, right. And it's like, well. Sometimes when you go down those warm holes, those, those rabbit holes they call them when you get on the internet, sometimes yeah. I think uh, some of that stuff's put in place to keep us divided a yeah. little bit maybe. Uh, <laughs> Although I will say if Jeremy pisses me off, I usually get out of what I want to do by saying it's like three month. <laughs> there you go. That's right. There you go. <laughs> I, nope, I'm not. <laughs> Jeremy's not suffering from white guilt, right? No, nope, I am not. <laughs> Uh, and this is the kind I'm, of thing. I'm Irish and German, well, so there you go. There. <laughs> like maybe there's a little bit of guilt over there, but the one part, definitely for sure, we don't got any guilt. We picked our own fucking potatoes. And you also had signs that said Irish need not apply. Yeah, yeah. They were a lot of people forgot about that history. You know, yeah. that it isn't just the people of color that've been discriminated against in this in this world. Um, but that's another rabbit hole. Yeah, <laughs> you know, find, find me a group that hasn't been right, Brian. Something you said that I was interested about is you talked about how you kind of gave up on this idea of the service because of some of the stuff, but then you kept working kind of parallel to the industry <laughs> right. in the fire sprinkler side. Like, right. And I'm sure we can get to it too as well with some of the anger you have, but there had to be some resentment almost every time you went to work. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, there was because I would be dealing with uh, fire suppression systems, but it did serve me well later whenever we were dealing with fire suppression systems, and I had some experience with it. Um the thing is that the reason why I was angry was because uh, I'm gonna let me just start off with uh, when I hit my rock bottom. When I hit my rock bottom was in 2021. Um, it was October, and uh, uh, it had been at that time five years since my wife had passed, and she passed in August. Her birthday was in October. Um, my dad's birthday's in October. My real father Ken, and then my stepfather Richie. Um, his death date is October. And uh, so when I remember I mentioned about I had a lot of things happening to me in, in, in right in a row. And that's how come the title looks like. I can't make this shit up if I tried. But so basically, we actually had um, Nikki get diagnosed with, with cancer. And then unbeknownst to us, my stepfather of 31 years had been going to a doctor and not telling nobody. We noticed he'd been tired, got a little bit of a distension in his belly. But uh, he finally comes to us and uh, says he's got stage four lung cancer and goes in for a biopsy. And then they decide they're going to remove some of the infected tissue, lung tissue, and ruptures his aorta and he bleeds out and dies on the operating table, which was kind of a blessing in disguise because he was terminal. You know, he was going to maybe last a year if they did. And chemo. not a good year. And not a good yeah. year. Right. And so um, my mother, um, she ends up moving in with me and helping taking care of my wife. Um, for the next two years, and then we lost her. And then after we lost her, my kids, they kind of, uh, there's a lot to this story, but my kids took off and uh, went to Florida. And so, you know, one week, and nothing against them, they, they, they needed to go. My two daughters needed to go to Florida. And my son, he stuck around, but he was distant, and they just lost their mom, man. So they're dealing with their grief in their own way. And um, so one week, I got a family. Next week, I don't. <laughs> And so, um, but what, what that stems from is that I ended up getting into hitting my rock bottom, right? Um, there's a lot that goes on between then and there, but, um, here I am going to the COE. Uh, I got to that point, um, where we, we ran a call in, uh, October that, that year, 2021. And I was, uh, at a, my last fire department that I worked for. It's a smaller department. Um, but it was a it was a bad call. It was a domestic call, and um, it was it was horrific. Uh, dealing with the uh, 
the wife uh, and the, the domestic call um, was going to start administering aid to her. Walking up on her, it was it was one of the more gruesome beatings that I've ever witnessed. And uh, I was told, no, I need to go inside with the medical bag. And we went inside and uh, the other half of the um, situation in there, he was laying on the floor, agonal, naked as a jaybird with a gunshot wound on in his sternum. And I'd never seen a gunshot wound like this. I'd, I'd only seen like four or five gunshot wounds in my career. I had a ten-year civilian career, but um, it wasn't. It was. It was. It wasn't bleeding. It was charred. It was black and, and cauterized. And uh, I reached underneath and lifted him up to see if there's an exit wound because there was no. It was a hardwood floor and there was nothing there and there was no blood pooling. So I wanted to see if there's an exit wound. There wasn't. So uh, evidently the bullet must have lodged in the spine or something. Um, so, and it was a nine millimeter because we saw the casings laying around and all this is happening in a milliseconds, you know, you know how it is. Yeah. Um, but he's laying there agonal and all I can guess is that he, that he must've had somebody press a, a, the pistol right against the skin and pull the trigger because the muzzle flash cauterized it. And, uh, um, we, we get him loaded, go and, uh, he ends up dying at the hospital, of course. And here I am going, you know, he deserved it. You know, but we, we knew him too, though. He, he actually worked for the department that I worked at, um, didn't work there when I worked there. I met him at the gym a few times, um, knew of him, didn't know him very well. And, uh, other people on scene knew him well. And, uh, it just was, it was a tragic thing, but he was doing things he shouldn't have been doing and committed a horrific, you know, crime against his wife. So, um, I know she suffered some pretty bad damage and I think a lifelong is you know, def- deficits with that, but um, so here I am, um, reliving my wife's death. Um, my wife spent 59 minutes on air, off air. I'm sorry, we had her on BPAP. She because uh, the lung cancer, the the breast cancer had spread to her lungs, and um, the last six days in the hospital, it was just consuming, consuming, you know, like all the time. Um, and so when we finally got to that point, we needed to decide to, to take her off life support. Um, took her off the air at one o'clock and at one fifty nine, she lasted fifty nine minutes. She took her last breath. And during that fifty nine minutes, it looked like a guppy out of water. Just you know, just, and this is the body acting because she's totally sedated. They dilated her so much. She was just asleep. But yeah. um so when she took that last breath and slumped over, I um God, I just I lost it. Um I was in her chest. Uh, I wailed like a stuck pig um i just hugged her and i pushed what air was left in her lungs out and it went across my face and that really fucked with me um i probably laid there on her for a good good 30 minutes before i was able to gather myself and everybody left the room left me alone um as i'm coming out of the icu room Poor nurse sitting there at the table. She's bawling. <laughs> they gotten to know us, you know, over the last six days. And uh, I was like, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to make you cry. <laughs> and uh, it, was t- it was touching, but it was, it was horrific. You know, it was the worst day of my life. <laughs> Understandably so. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so because of that, um, this call reminded me of the, that hour and that six days. And the two years prior to, and um, I was pissed. I was, I was back at the station, and just you know, catwalking um, in my room because um, we got back. It was, that call came out like at three a.m. We didn't get back to the station till like four four thirty. Mm-hmm. By the time we were done wrapping everything up, and so let me ask you a question, Brian. Yeah. So when you're when you went through all this stuff with your stepdad, then your wife. Did you ever go get any help? Um, at that point, yeah, I, I had um, after after Richie, no, because um, it was just supposed to be kind of you know you're you're kind of expected to lose your parents, but you know still tragic. Um, but after Nikki, I was involved with the department I was working for at the time, um, their EAP, um, and they did they did well. They tried their best. They, I had some moments there was hard to get into places and the hard thing about the ap system with most uh, municipalities is that you're dealing with counselors who don't know how to deal with us it's especially then yeah yeah, yeah and this is 2016 I, I was actually seeing eap counselors in 14 and 15 and then 16 is when she passed but yeah um and uh it was really rougher back then for to find somebody who actually could deal with um 
what we see and deal with. And uh, that's that's the other thing. Um, this this whole hitting that rock bottom was an accumulation of stuff, lifelong, not realizing it. Mm-hmm. So there I am. I'm on my knee. I, oh, actually, I come home from shift finally because uh, we get relieved at 7 a.m. I'm driving home, and I'm as I described in the excerpt you read and stuff. I'm banging my steering wheel, man. I'm pissed off. I'm I'm screaming. You know how fucking dare you remind me of my you know ha, just you know several times, just letting loose. And uh, I get home, and I figure that's just a way for me to vent. And then I get home, and I'm like, okay, walk in the kitchen, do my thing, look over and see my dog. I'm laying on her side and thinking she's sleeping in the doorway of the bedroom. And then I noticed, wait a second, there was a puddle of piss underneath her tail. And I'm like, son of a bitch. And I know what that means. Christ. You know, yeah. uh, Every every freaking, you know, I've come across plenty of, you know, calls. We come on a DOA and there they are. They're sitting in their own shit. But um, so I was like, damn it. So I went and grabbed a towel and, uh, Wrapped her up in a towel, and cleaned up the mess, and uh, and I was and I was emotional. I was like, her name was Maggie. She was a good dog, <laughs> and uh, um, I, I given her fourteen years prior to <laughs> to my wife for Christmas, and uh, so it was my wife's dog. So so there I am. I take her out and I go grab a shovel and go to the back corner of my yard, and I got a decent sized yard, so it's a little walk. Um, start digging, and man, I'm like, just another death just another fucking death man just digging digging and i lay her in the ground and i'm like i lose my shit man i'm like i'm like just wailing and bawling out there in the back of my yard and it's a saturday morning it was uh, october 15th and uh i'm like are you kidding me man i'm just 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 wailing and the pain's overcoming me man the um the the fear the guilt the 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 feeling of of failure all the all things, not having my kids around, hurting a lot of my friends in the past five years. I've been on this downward spiral since my wife passed away. I'll get into more of that a little bit later, but I, I was ready. I got to that point where I'm like, okay, I can't feel this pain no more. It's just there residing right here in my sternum, right? It's just, just this empty pit in my, in my gut. And um, it hurts. It hurts bad. And I'm like, man... <laughs> I'm done, man. I'm done. I, I, I'm going to go inside and I'm going to end it. It's, it's time. It's time just to be done. I just want to go be with my wife. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, as I'm walking in, I, I finished burying Maggie. I'm walking to the house. I got a 45 in my bedroom dresser. It's like we're always loaded and ready to go. And, uh, I'm going to go straight to the bedroom. I'm going to take the gun out of the freaking drawer. I'm going to just cock back the hammer, not worry about it this time, not think about it. Just go ahead, stick in my mouth, pull trigger, be done. As I'm walking up to that door, nine months prior to this, a good friend of mine and a coworker and somebody I served on the honor guard with at one of the departments I worked at um, had, had killed himself. And he left behind a beautiful wife and two beautiful children. He was a captain for one of the other fire departments in the area. Um, man, and he was a peer support guy. He he was there for me when my wife died. He was there for me when I lost my job at the department we worked at together. Um, he had left that department too and went to another one. Um, that's where he became captain. But uh, so, anyways, he had committed suicide. So, and we were at his funeral. And so here I am. I'm. I'm. In, I'm I have this vision in my head. I'm on my motorcycle. Just got through with the funeral big firefighter funeral and I'm driving home, riding home. And I look up this guy and I'm like, was that good enough for you, brother? I hope, I hope that was a good enough fucking send off for you. We gave you, they gave you a, a fireman's fucking funeral, man. Like you're killed in the line of duty or something, you know? And I was mad. I loved him. I loved him with all my heart, man. He was a good man. He still is a good man, but he, he, uh, he was suffering. He was suffering. And he, I think, for me and my personal experience, knowing him and knowing what he had witnessed and seen um, other firefighters in the industry around these departments in this area were being put out the pasture when they started to show signs of mental distress or fatigue. Um, me being one of them and uh, another one that I worked with at the same department. Um, yeah, man, it, 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 I think he saw that and he didn't want to be put out the pasture or taken off the truck and it just finally got the best of him. 
And uh, had he had he just reached out for help, he'd have had a hundred motherfuckers at his door, man, because he helped that many people. You know what I mean? That's the kind of fireman he was. That's the kind of servant he was. And uh, his demons got the best of him. So you know, that's not a it's not an uncommon story. Yeah, yeah. It's because I mean, if you think about it, just take a a step back and think about it for a second. So not only are you seeing the trauma that we see on a daily basis on the job. Right. But then you're going the extra mile and you're going to be in peer support and you're going to do all these things so right. you can help out our brothers and sisters. Right. So you're taking all of their trauma too. Exactly. If you don't have your mental health on point, you're setting yourself up for failure. Right. Like it's, you got to go above and beyond at that point. Right. It, it's got to become, it's got to become a priority for you. Um, I remember, um, to divert a little bit, I remember several years prior to um, sitting in the uh, bay, we're sitting around chit-chatting, you know, in the evening after dinner on shift um, at the station. And one of the guys that, man, I admired this guy a lot at the time. I mean, I still do, but at the time I was like really enamored with him. But we were the same age, but he'd been in the department for long and he was a big dude, man. The kind of guy you just love having behind you in a fire or anything like that, right? <laughs> or on a scene. But um uh, I was asking one time, we were, they were talking, we were talking calls and stuff and gruesome stuff and uh, everybody kind of left and it was just me and him for a minute. As I asked him, well, how do you, how do you deal with that, man? Does it bother you at all? And he's like, nope, you know, put it in the box. Okay. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. Now I know of a couple guys in the service that I've met that actually, I think do that for real and kind of successfully, but I think they, and they've told me themselves, they think that they are, uh. Um, was that uh, uh, whenever somebody's like a serial killer? You sociopath? Know? A sociopath, yeah. They feel like they are sociopathic, but not in a way that they're going to go out and kill people, but it just things don't bother them. They're like cold as ice. Yeah, I mean, so, and I get that, and I was actually having this conversation with a friend of mine, um, and we were talking about mental health on the on the department and stuff, and, you know, he was not necessarily hinting around about that or whatever, and, you know, we got into a pretty deep conversation and he's like, well, yeah, I talked to my wife and I talked to this person and I talked to you and I talked, yes, dude, you have a support network. You Mm -hmm. talk about it just because we all go through these things. Doesn't mean all of us are going to have to go to therapy. Right. You know, if you have a support network and you're able to unload all of that stuff, you keep that cup from getting too full. Right. And you're, you're constantly resetting. You're doing what you have. You're doing what you need to do. Right. Now, for some people, that might not be enough, but for other people, it is because we're all different. We're all individuals. Exactly. And what, you know, we've talked about it, I don't know how many times, just because you go to talk therapy or EMDR and it worked for James or it worked for me or whatever, doesn't mean it's going to work for you. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody has their own makeup. That's, that's, I remember when we were in EMT school and we we're learning about the physiology of the body and everything. And you're like, Wow, it is an amazing network of just crazy, you know, vernacular structures and cellular structures and how things exchange and work with each other. And when you're starting to learn how that stuff works, you realize how unique and individual we really are. And and that goes in with emotions as well. That goes in with the the brain activity and um, which is something we haven't even kind of figured out. Mm-hmm. For the last 15 years. Right. You know, we, we in our A&P classes, you know, before EMT or medic or high school or college, we get really good at, like you said, learning all the systems of the body, how blood moves, how right. cells develop. Right. It's only been 10 or 15 years that we're finally realizing what the physiological responses that trauma is doing to the brain. It's, exactly. It's, it's insane. Yeah. I got a little bit of a taste of that um, after Nikki died. Um, one of the things, um, well, before Nikki passed away in, in 16, I think it was in 2015, they were really making a big push for um, peer support and mental health throughout the uh, country with all all the fire departments, police departments, things like that. It's almost like we knew a problem was coming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so it was the inception of it. No wasn't conspiracy it? theories. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, so this new inception of, of being able to try and talk about stuff and whatnot. So we're sitting there and... And we had this um, gentleman come from an outside um, agency to speak to us and and at the training center for the department. And um, the things they're telling us about were, you know, things to look for are three major behaviors that start taking place when people are suffering from things bothering them on the job. 
i.e. maybe having some PTSD, um, is that they will drink heavily, which that's, <laughs> that's pretty normal, you know, on the, on the first responder world. Uh, or they'll do drugs, um, you know, illicit drug use. Or they will have um, risk, risky sexual behavior. That was another one. Well, um, I'm not a drug addict. Uh, I never have. I mean, I've done drugs in my life, but um, I've never done anything hard. I've always just been marijuana. Or I think opium was the worst thing I ever did when I was in high school. But I never got addicted to any of that stuff. Um, I don't have an addictive personality. Like I smoked on and off throughout my life several times, but I could just stop and didn't bother me, you know. Um, so, and here I am. I don't have a drug addiction. I don't drink. Um, I socially drank in my life before, but about 15 years, 17 years ago now, and long before I got in fire service publicly, uh, I had suffered some alcohol poisoning from celebrating a friend of ours coming home <laughs> from another state. <laughs> and, you know, Jameson, after about 12 or 13 beers and then six shots of Jameson, that just don't work, man. You know, and, and, and my late wife, God bless her, she, if I hadn't been in EMT school prior to this, I'd have known, oh, I'm, I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm in I'm in the bathroom that night, laying in the I was on the toilet and then because I, I was going number two really badly and then I felt I had to puke and so I opened the shower door and I puke in there at the same time I'm doing this so I got stuff coming out of everything and I end up in the fetal position in the base of the shower crying. <laughs> like a big baby. <laughs> and she's standing there and taking pictures. <laughs> and she's like, you deserve this, you son of a bitch. I told you not to drink that, Jameson. And I was like, oh, my God. Of course, the friend that we welcomed home, he's a functioning alcoholic. He's been a bartender for 35 years. It's like, thanks a lot, man, you know? Yeah. Uh, but any, anyway, yeah, so I never drank since then. Um, I maybe could milk a beer here and there, but um, never really got drunk, except the one time I was getting the road name of dick pic. I got a little tipsy that night <laughs> and we're saying things, I guess that, you know, we're coming after to haunt me. But after that, um, sincerely, really after that, I, I, I really, That's it. I not, swear this yeah, time. <laughs> I, I was done. I was done. Cause I didn't, I, I wanted to stay in control of myself and that stems from some other stuff that we'll talk about real quick about in, in a minute about the trauma that I experienced. Um, there's tra traumatic events in my life that had um, put me in a position of no control. And when every time I would lose control, I'd get mad or violent, you know, well, that's reaction. The, that's the, the default emotion, mm -hmm. right? Right. Is whenever you're sad, depressed, whatever, and you don't know how to express those emotions, right. it comes out as anger. Right. Exactly. And um, so there I was, you know. Um, so I'll bring us back to me being at the rock bottom. So there I am going into take care of myself and, I, and I'm, I'm remembering my friend and his family and all the pain that was left behind. And, uh, I decided that I don't need to do that. Um, I went as far as I, I made a, a memorial decal t-shirt and everything. Our motorcycle club raised money for him, um, and his family. Uh, man, I thought to myself, as I wrote in the book, I don't want to be a decal on the back of some brother or sister's win or you know window of their car if they so choose to to put it on there to remember me or be a a memorial ride or a t-shirt you know i need to live i mean i got i got at this point in my life i've got a grandchild and i still got three kids and they're all grown and and uh i got a mom that's living with me and there's things for me to be around for man and I still got a lot of riding to do on my motorcycle, so I got things to see and shit, you know. So I'm like, yeah, I need to, I need to stick around. So, um, thinking of of him and and the funeral made me reach and grab my phone instead of going upstairs. And I called my union rep. Now I had lost my job at the other major department. I was fired, and uh, we'll get into that too. But uh, I stayed active in the union. I'm a very pro union guy, dude. And the reason why I'm pro union is because First of all, for first responders, it's a necessary thing to have. If you don't have it at your department, get it. Find out how to get it. Get it formed up. And I don't even care if it's you're in a state that doesn't recognize it. The benefit you can get from the death benefit and then also counseling and as well as uh, um, litigation, you know, like uh, legal counsel. But um, also having the uh, center of excellence available to you. That is a huge, huge benefit for that. 60 80 bucks a month or whatever it is at whatever department i think ours was 35 because it was smaller but you guys i think maybe pay 80 or something how, how, how i get that 
How we yeah. get them cheap? Yeah. How we get them cheap eating dudes? Yeah. Right. right. I think we're well over eighty now. Yeah. Well, I don't even look on my check anymore because I just don't <laughs> want to get pissed off about it. <laughs> right. You and I have very different opinions of unions. So well, well, well I will say that. this. I will say that I, I know where you're coming from because the, there is a corrupt side of union ships, and and that's that's got to be stayed in control of and stand on top. But the benefits that are available to the members that are that are very successfully or not successful, very detrimental to our. Our, our health, our mental health, it, it's there. It's there. And you, well, and that's something, I mean, to be honest, I didn't even think about of, I thought, oh, you know, center of excellence is open to firefighters. Well, yeah, but only if you're in the IFF. Right, right. So, I get it. And what, what's the last count? How many, uh, per, what's the percentage of firefighters in this country that aren't IAFF? Oh, God, I, I think we only make up. Twenty five percent, yeah, right. twenty five or thirty percent of us. Yeah, like the volunteer, have, the volunteer yeah. forces is the majority of fire departments. Yeah, yeah. no, yeah, I, that's, I that's a whole nother conversation. Yeah, we literally just started talking about that. Yeah, you know, part of the show. Right. Well, I'm a bit biased because I did go there and it did save my life. So I, I'm I'm so pro for it, you know, and I and because of the success that they've had with their patients, and not only that, but what I experienced there for those forty three days was phenomenal, and um. So I'm very pro union, yeah. So that's for that aspect yeah. of it. I get it, and and I agree. I agree with you too on that other aspect of it. it's got to be police. It's got to be taken care of, and um, that's a big job. Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> and, usually the people that are the best at that job are the ones that don't want that job. Right. If somebody right. wants that job, right, eh, start right. thinking. <laughs> right. Well, um, well, so then I, there I was. I, I I was on the phone with the. Uh, the center of excellence and uh, they got me a date to come in and uh i i worked a couple more shifts and um i told uh on the shift that i was gonna the last shift i was on i told the buddy i was working with because it was a very small department we had three guys on shift i told him uh hey i'm not gonna be around for about, about 30 days <laughs> just so you know <laughs> are you gonna tell the chief and no i'm not telling him he's one of the reasons why i'm going but um he'll find out and because when you get to the center, you can, uh, I was getting ready to go on four day. We were on Berkeley schedules, you know, I know you guys are Kelly, I think. Yeah. But, um, so we had those four days off and, uh, um, I left that th the next day and I was in Maryland the day after that and reporting in and then they filed my FL, um, FMLA paperwork, which that particular chief, <laughs> he's a piece of work. Um, that guy, he denied my FMLA. Now, coincidentally at the same time, I didn't know this. I had no idea. My captain on that shift took off too. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. So okay. it wasn't just me. <laughs> it was dealing with some stuff. But uh, yeah, so um, he denied my FMLA. He said we didn't qualify for it because our department wasn't large enough, didn't have 30 more employees. And it's like my lawyer got involved and, and my captain's lawyer got involved and says, you need to read the uh, federal you know, guidelines here because you're a municipality. You're, you're part of a civil service. You're, yeah. That doesn't count for you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I ended up being there, and he was one of those guys. He wanted to know what was going on every week that I was there. I was like, I don't have to tell you anything. No. It's, it, it's not your business. When I get back, well, we can talk. But uh, When I know. don't want to punch you in the fucking face, <laughs> right, then we right. will have a conversation. Right, right. I'll, I'll ref I mean, that's one of the things I want to make sure I try to learn to do, too, since this is my first time talking about stuff. Some things in my head I was trying to remember. I don't want to come across like a victim, man. And and, and I did for a long time. I was a I suffered from victim mentality for a while, and uh, I come to to terms with that. But um, the thing is, is that in this world we we just have, I guess it's I've really come to learn what you put out you receive, right? Uh, if you put out negative energy, you're gonna get some negative stuff coming back. It's probably why I look like a little bit like a hippie right now, but because I've been through some experiences with that. Um, I have done psilocybin um, therapy, and that's really opened my my mind up to things, you know, and helping me understand and, and deal with my traumas. I have um, done EMDR therapy for two years. Um, it started at the COE. Um, so uh, so there I was um, at the COE getting the help I can get um, without boring there all the listeners and stuff with the details of what takes place there. It's basically you're uh, incepted, you're stripped down searched everything all your stuff's confiscated you're taking your phone away taking your taking your i had a little shaving like safety razors they're gone mm -hmm. um everything because anything you can use to hurt yourself or whatnot they take from you yeah and um and it's really kind of weird because it's not weird but it's really kind of cool um they have three stations um they're they're old uh 
bunk houses and they made them up like stations with day rooms, kitchen, bunk rooms. And so that was kind of cool, you know, kind of keeping that theme going. And then everybody there is a, a firefighter or a paramedic. And um, so they receive you and I had to stay in um, detox for a couple of days. And so I'm sitting there in detox, man. And I'm like, I'm not an alcoholic. I'm and a couple other guys are there just, I mean, they're, passed out or they're trying to you know recover from their bender they just went on before they got in there because a lot of them do uh, yeah <laughs> that's uh whenever i was in i had a guy come in and he was he looked like death warmed over right because he had spent the night before at a hotel just getting hammered right well the first brother that i met at the coe real tall guy from uh out east, out in the west coast the major department northwest coast and uh wonderful guy but he introduces himself, and he's got two black eyes and a bandage on his nose, and real beautiful shiners. I'm like, what happened to you? And he goes, a couple of days before I got here, I really got, got, went out of bender, and I ended up face planting in the shower. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> but um, so yeah, so I'm sitting there going, why am I stuck in here, man? And and, and the other the other part of it was, I'm I'm like missing something, and it's like, what the hell am I missing, man? I'm missing this damn cyber freaking thing we have in our hands all the time you know this this uh, this tool that we use to surf our internet and our social media and all this stuff but what i was searching though for what i was jonesing for was my addiction and i didn't realize i had an addiction and my addiction was swipe right or swipe left on suzy q and you know betty sue and whoever else is posting their life out there for us to go meet and uh um I started realizing that I was like wondering if I had a problem, what I was really doing, because after my wife passed away, well, first of all, before my wife passed away, um, one of the things that uh, we were involved in in our lives, um, it's called the swinging lifestyle. And uh, they call it the lifestyle, but uh, it's discreet. Most people are discreet about it, even though you see and meet a lot of people from your own career and whatnot when you're at these meetings and parties and stuff. Um, I'm not going to get in a big bunch of detail about how that works. I'm sure you all understand all that, and you can go look it up yourselves. But for me, it's not Caligula. It's not orgies every freaking weekend. It's not that kind of deal. Um, it was friendships developed with some people, and uh, we had come to a point in our lives where we're like, look, I don't want to cheat on you. but um, And she didn't want to cheat on me, and, and they had some desire. And it was copacetic. It worked for us a little bit. So when she did get sick... Um, it came time where she was like on chemo all the time. She was like, you know, we can't be intimate and guys, you know, I know they go on deployments and stuff and all that kind of thing. And the longest I'd ever not been intimate with a, a mate of mine was when I was on a deployment in the Navy prior to, and, and, and this, this is selfish. This is a selfish part of my, my carniality, my body. Um, and I found out why I was this way at the COE is that, I couldn't function right if I wasn't getting laid. Man, I'm a grumpy son of a bitch or something. If I don't get laid every so often, I have some sort of release, you know. And um, so Nick, she was like, look, just go find somebody. Just not somebody we know. Let's go find somebody to help you out. And and I didn't take her up at first. And I was like, whatever, you give me a kitchen pass. I'm not going for that shit, whatever. But And I shouldn't have done it, but I did. I reached out, got a hold of a couple of uh, couples and and, uh, and a single um, woman that I met. And uh, once a week or so, I was able to take care of myself as she was going to work still. She was doing her thing. I never missed any appointments with her. I never missed taking care of her and doing all that. But um, I was able to do that on my days off, um, maybe about once a week or so, meet up with somebody and have my have my have uh, that, that itch scratched, whatever you want to call it, and satisfy myself that way. Um, what happened was, um, I ended up with the single female and in all honesty, uh, because I, I promised myself I would divulge everything to the world in my book, which I'm doing. And, uh, I did meet a woman who was a prostitute. Um, I, I'd gone that far to needing to find somebody to talk to and, and not just talk to need to find somebody to be with. And, um, selfishly it was a big selfish deal man and biggest biggest regret in my life and um she was a good she was a good person don't get me wrong i mean just because somebody uh, sells their body for sex doesn't mean they're a bad person um and 
there's that's a debatable subject matter for other people. I don't want to get into that, but whether you should allow it or not. But I did. I went down that road and I met her and I only paid for it once. After that, she hit it off with me and her, I guess my story and everything else kind of got to her and we became friends, if you will, with benefits type thing. And uh, it came to about, a, it was about a year long um, of a uh, affair. And uh, my wife knew about it, didn't know the details about it, didn't want to know the details about it. And uh, I still saw the other couples a couple times here and there. Um, the thing was, is that the single female I met, who was, who was the prostitute, um, she stopped doing that, and but she was interested in the lifestyle. So I introduced her to that part of it too, a little bit here and there. And there were pictures of us a couple times at a couple parties, just hanging out, you know, and whatnot that we do, took for ourselves. Um, I confided in her about all the stuff that was going on. Um, you know, we're doing this chemo, we're doing that. And, and you know, she was like my soundboard, man. Um, whenever I got to talk to her on the phone, text, whatever, I was, you know, crying on her shoulder about this, that, and the other, telling her about this person or that person in our lives who wasn't showing up at our doorstep and, and uh, like they said they would, that kind of thing. You know, you find out who your friends really are, man, whenever you get terminally ill. <laughs> yeah. The fire service, though, I'm going to give kudos, man. Everybody in the fire service I worked with um, at that department and neighboring departments, man, they showed up. They showed up. They did it. Um, bringing food, hanging out, done that kind of thing. So anyways, um, after Nikki passed, um, the single female, she wanted to be with me in a relationship. And I was like, I'm not ready for that right now, you know? And uh, so she had been, she got mad about it. And she uh, went to social media. She, she went to a person uh, that I spoke about that was a um, friend of my wife's. Um, and she exposed everything about what we were doing to her. Here's what Brian was doing, cheating on his dying wife for the past year with me. And then there were some pictures. And there were some explicit pictures, a couple of them, that we had taken to, uh, with each other. And uh, that person <laughs> found it necessary to take her friend's um, you know, the lifelong friend she had had, not respect her dead friend, but go ahead and share it with everybody that she knows on Facebook, including my in-laws, my brothers, my sisters, my grandparents, my daughters, my son, and everybody else. So then I'm getting a phone call from a friend of mine who's working for another department, um, sheriff's department, asking me who uh, the name, by name, asking me who this female is. And I was like, well, you're the cop. You should know. <laughs> So then I was like, well, and, and again, this part, when I talk about this kind of stuff, I truly am not trying to be vindictive or anything. I'm telling my story and people aren't going to like it, uh, but guess what? I'm dirty in it. I'm dirty in it too. And I'm, I'm, I'm telling my dirt and my regret and how I got past it, man. Um, I was wrong and I was selfish and I had no idea that that was, <sighs> what I was really doing. I was in a different kind of fog or world, you know, I wasn't doing, I, I wish I'd have gotten into the bottle. I wish I'd have just drunk whiskey out the ass because had I done that, everybody would have been like, Oh, let's help him. You know, but when it got exposed that he was a cheating on his dying wife, um, swinger hired a hooker, you know, well, there you go. I'm a piece of shit. Um, let alone, uh, you weren't there for, every fucking appointment you weren't there for every freaking you know crying session or shaving her head and she's crying or wiping her ass because she can't freaking walk to the bathroom putting in the you know having your friends at the department to actually help me put in the um grab bars and all the areas of the house and you know they weren't there for all that stuff you know and and dealing and walking in my shoes and, and i'm not trying to say i'm justified in what i did I made mistakes, man. There's no book on how to handle this kind of grief and this kind of trauma that's going on in your life. And um, I'm doing the best. I'm navigating the best way I thought I was needed to. And everybody's always telling you, you're the caretaker. Take care of yourself, too. You need time to take care of yourself. Well, the only time I took care of myself was when she went to work. My late wife was a hell of an employee. And she was also Irish. And Irish women are very, very bullheaded and very, <laughs> and very, very... <laughs> They, they also like to bury their issues. You know, they don't like to talk about their issues a lot. So she wasn't trying to face or talk about this cancer. She just wanted to go to work and forget about it. And that was her way of coping. God bless her, you know. 
Um, there was a lot, man. There's a whole lot. I mean, I could write just a whole book just on the two years experience of what we went through. It sounds cancer. like she should have been a firefighter. We're talking oh, about going dude. to work and not coping. <laughs> she was, she was, yeah, she would have been a great firefighter. <laughs> she was strong as hell too, man. Yeah, she was great. Yeah. But so there I am, man. I'm, I'm wishing I'd been in the bottle, but I'm finding out I was addicted to um, intimacy or, or, or I know there's all kinds of derogatory terms you could call it, man, but it is what it is, man. And um, a lot of people don't talk about this side of the uh, the three choices they have, but here I am. I'm opening up about it. I own it. I ain't proud of it, man. I'm yeah. not proud of it at all. Well, yeah, I mean, but like you said, I mean, it's no, it's no different than the drugs or the alcohol. It's just another vice. Right. And considering your background— I'm not shocked, you know? I feel like a lot of people who deal with, uh, we're adrenaline junkies, and we're programmed to be adrenaline junkies well, because of that, that, that alarm that goes off at 2 o'clock in the morning we, with no warning. We are, we are risk-averse, risk as averse. well as being <laughs> adrenaline junkies. <laughs> right. So we want that shot of adrenaline, and then, oh, well, the risk of getting that shot is you may die. I don't care. Right. Right. It's not going to happen to me. Right. I got it under control. I can handle it. Right. Or this isn't a problem. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so, okay, so I, I get to the COE, right? Uh, and that's what I'm realizing. The first thing I'm realizing, I must have an addiction or something. It got confirmed later. But here I am. I'm like, I just wanted to come here to have you all help me not want to kill myself anymore. Okay. There's steps to that. <laughs> yeah. So that's what I'm thinking. They're just going to fix me. <laughs> fix it. Fix it now. <laughs> yeah. Fix me and then let me get back to work. But that's another story too. I wanted to go back to work. I did. I could, I could physically do it, you know, but here I was, they said, well, okay. The, the cancer's first question to me was, what's your earliest childhood memory? What's your earliest traumatic childhood memory? <laughs> what? <laughs> I thought we were going to talk about, you know, how, how I wanted to kill myself last week, you know, and no, we're going to get there. Just, well, shit. Okay. Uh, and I have one. Um, and then I have a bunch and I'm like, when I was three years old and I remember this vividly, it plays in my head. My, my 22 year old mother, I think she was at the time, um, drove, we, we lived behind my grandparents, drove around the corner Never stopped the vehicle, kicked the door open, threw my ass out of the car. No seatbelts being worn back then. And I hit the ground, and I was scraped up on my knees and my hands. And my, my grandmother, my Hispanic grandma, was out there screaming and yelling at her in Spanish. My mom never stopped. And I remember that memory in my head. You know, have you, when you're young and you guys have those memories when you're real young, and they kind of play in your head here and there, but you don't really focus on them you kind of maybe forget about them but then they're brought up later because you know somebody says something about it or something well you know years later <laughs> my wife is sitting there and my parents are there at the house we're having dinner doing whatever and they start talking about oh you remember this you remember that and then my mom's like you remember when i threw brian out of the car <laughs> laughing <laughs> and it's like and then that night hold the fuck up <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> right right Let's yeah. let's let's go to the replay. Yeah. Tim. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No shit. And that night, uh, Nick stood there and she uh she put her arm around me. Uh, and I was standing brushing my teeth at the and she came up to me behind me. She put her arm around me, she goes, I love you and now I know what's wrong with you. And she wasn't joking. You know, she wasn't playing around. And I was like, What? <laughs> what are you talking about? And she's like that story your mother told us, oh, yeah, I've heard it several times in my life. You know, it is what it is. You know, do you really remember that? Yeah, it happens. And, you know, I just, I just got tossed from the car, no big deal. The reason why I felt like that is because that's what they did. My wife, my, my, my mom and my dad, he was, he was traumatically affected by Vietnam. He was traumatically affected by the, his father making him have sex with his sisters when they were six and he was six and she was nine and the other sister was 12. Um, sexual abuse and mental abuse and physical abuse was heavy there. And I found that out later, but now that I, when I found that out, I could go back in time and go, now I see why he was the way he was. Now I gave him credit where credit's due. He beat my ass. He beat the shit out of me all the time. He cursed me all the time, but he never sexually assaulted me 
or did anything to me sexually ever. And I think that's the one step pro like the one step getting better. Like with my kids, I cursed them bad at times, I, I, but I never beat them. I never, they had a handful of spankings or whoopings with three, never bare assed, none of that throughout their lives. And it's like maybe five, each kid maybe got five. And Nikki was responsible for a couple of those. <laughs> she <laughs> was Irish. <laughs> yeah, she was Irish. <laughs> and but all, all the kids, they, they're good. I say that they have their own traumas. They have their own issues with me and stuff because verbal abuse and even some of those spankings to them were traumatic. Mm-hmm. And they have every right to be traumatic for them. Um, that's something I learned at COE too. There, before the COE, I was like, get over it, kid. You didn't get beat like I did. I never, you know. Mm-hmm. Back in my day. Back in, yeah. yeah, right. I walked uphill both ways <laughs> through the snow. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. Yeah. So I learned to be like, no, this isn't the trauma Olympics, man. You know, it, it, trauma is trauma for that person. Um, and you, you have to respect that. And then you can learn to work through it and get and, and deal with it. So, but here I am, um, I being thrown from a car <laughs> and, and, uh, they fought all the time and it was, it was a violent household. Um, a lot of time, a lot of yelling, screaming, uh, broken furniture pieces, things like this. Um, but I didn't know any different, man. I mean, I, I just, I don't know if I had this thought, but I've kind of figured maybe it was just the way it was everywhere. You know, this is, this is life. I just didn't know any different. And so my uncle, who was only eight years older than me, so I'm four at the time, almost five, because I started kindergarten at the age of four. I'm a June baby because I graduated when I was 17, joined, joined the Navy, remember? Mm-hmm. So um, I got this yearbook, man, and I'm like, oh, excited about this yearbook because this is the next thing that they asked me to remember. And it's like, well... I brought it home and, and my uncle's like, he's just, he's 12. <laughs> he's 1975. And he's like, cool. And then that night he's like, you want to see some, cause I was, I was always spending the night there. And he goes, you want to see some pictures of some girls? And I thought he was talking about a yearbook, his yearbook. I'm like, yeah, I'm excited. But you know, here it is midnight. <laughs> and so we, we go sneaking down the basement and, uh, um, penthouse, playboy, hustler, we jugs. And I remember these titles because they were so impactful on me at the age of four, almost five, in 1975, mind you. So I'm looking at this pornographic, and there, and and Playboy was classy, you know, but it was still naked women. <laughs> they were soft lighted and all that. So was Penthouse, but but yeah. they were all about it was classy. Dude. Yeah, it was classy. <laughs> but but they were okay, all about, Ron Burgundy, <laughs> right? Exactly. <laughs> and, and you see, this is good to laugh about it because honestly, exposing a a young a child that young to sexual content is a crime. And yeah. he wasn't trying to be, he wasn't trying to be criminal. He's 12 years old, man. He just wanted to see some boobs. And he had this little brother slash nephew up his butt and be in his shadow all the time. So what's he going to do? Well, I got that education from him. I'm like, well, what are they doing here? And what are they doing here? And you know, of course, <laughs> back then, um, I got a pee pee, right? I don't know that they're, well, she's giving him a blowjob. What's a blow? <laughs> so I'm getting all this education. He's telling me all these different things about what you can imagine. Okay. I don't want to get too much detail, but it was explicit. Mm-hmm. It wasn't moving pictures. They were all magazines, but it was yeah. explicit. And as I'm telling the counselor about that, I'm like, I do remember getting aroused. You know, I was that young, but I was like, how can I be getting aroused? I did. And then I remember for a couple of years, you know, I was sneaking in and grabbing the magazines and I was masturbating to them. You know, nothing was coming out of me. I mean, I wasn't mature enough to ejaculate, but... And, and I'm sorry to be too gross, but I'm just being real, man. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it was pleasurable. It, it felt good. And I would know I would do that when I was stressed or when I was experiencing uh, my parents fighting or something in the other room, right? And I would just rub one out and whoop, I'm good. That became addictive or that, that became habit forming for me. And anytime I got stressed about anything. Um, so the next thing that was taking place was. Remember, I told you about my dad's dad, and I, I refused to call him. He he he's 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 an ass. He's he's evil, and I don't want to refer to him as a as he doesn't deserve the title. Um, so uh, he was taking me fishing, uh, before, and, and now he was telling me stories, and because of my newfound education on sex, you know, in 1975 version of a 12 year old sex education. I knew what parts were. I knew what the derogatory words were for the anatomy and stuff. And this man, um, being in his 50s at the time, 
has his, you know, five, six, seven, eight, because he did it until I was eight, telling me these stories of his explicit sexual conquest that he had with his babysitter or his other girlfriend or this one woman throughout his life and telling me, you know, I was putting my, yeah, nah, 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 and all this, and I was doing this, and, that, and just in detail, grotesque detail. And I understood it. And he was like, this is just our, this is just our, between us, this is between us. I'm like, okay. And he had a camper on the back of that truck that had those overhang campers over the cab. You know, and when you're a little boy, you think that's cool to be up in that little area, right? And I had a couple other male cousins that were about my age and several female cousins that were various ages, a few years older, a couple years younger, all that kind of thing. So <laughs> he'd take me fishing. And I suppressed this, and I got this through EMDR. So when I'm in my EMDR course and or, or you know, uh, counseling session and it comes up that about the conversations and i remember those but then it comes up about what he was doing with me in the back of that freaking camper out there at blake and i didn't want to believe it was real or true so i thought even as far as this nice woman who's helping me is putting that in my head she had to have suggested that to me because those of you that don't know what emdr is um i as E M I memory displacement. It's eye movement desensitization desensitization. Yeah, uh, R R word. Yeah, yeah R, -word. R word. It, it's and, and we're fine. We're firemen here. <laughs> not a doctor. <laughs> we're not doctors. Yeah, I'm not gonna. But when I first heard about it, I thought it was hokey pokey because you know, mm -hmm. um, well, you're gonna just make me tap my hands back and forth left and right or you're going to make me hold some buzzers or you're going to make me watch some light go back and forth Wait, mm -hmm. okay. well, you should try neurofeedback then you thought that's hokey <laughs> <laughs> well so I'm sitting there and we're doing the light the lights back and forth and and we're going into it. and by god man you know the only thing I experienced prior to that was um transmental meditation where you're guided and like you can relax and lay and the the guider or the not guide or the whoever's <laughs> guiding the meditation is describing like now you're walking down a flight of stairs to the left it's calm you're coming to a mirror and you're facing yourself now what do you you know all these things and as they're describing this you're really you're really like playing a video game in your head and you're like first person going through this 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 dreamscape you know like a dream state and that's what it was like for me when I went under with the EMDR I was actually back in that area. I could tell you the color of the carpet. I could tell you what the smells were, all the sounds. And it transports you back into that traumatic memory if you allow, if you allow yourself to open up. Yeah. And we had one guy at COE prior to me, and I'm sitting there. I'm like, I'd heard about it, and he was a combat veteran as well. I'd heard about that. Uh, he, through his, his therapy, he ran through the wall. I mean, in the middle of it, because he had been so in depth in, in his experience, and there it was, patched up the wall. <laughs> he didn't go all the way through it. <laughs> he did not go all the way through it, but he went halfway through it through a couple between a couple studs through that sheetrock because he started running towards the wall. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, okay, this is crazy, but it, it, it's true. It works, and it's and and it's all about. And so I can complete that thought. It's all about. Uh, um, basically, it was explained to me like this: if you have a file cabinet and you've got a bunch of files in that cabinet and but like each file is a call like each folder is a call and inside that folder is the details of the call whatnot all the papers well you have that that call happen you come back you throw your papers in there and you throw the the file in there because another call just came so you're going for the next folder mm -hmm. and so you're so these events are taking place and the next thing you know you got all this stuff just crammed in there unorganized and you can't shut the drawer so i'm sorry I'm no, you're good. um so if you can't shut the drawer you can't be organized so let's get things organized so what we're doing is we're going in that traumatic memory we're going to unpack it we're going to relift some of it we're going to and now we're going to readdress how to cope with it now and then put it back and and you know nice and tidy and put it there and then grab the next one and eventually after you're done with all of them you're going to be able to shut that drawer and then you'll be able to, in a healthy way, go back and open it and look when you need to and then put it back instead of it being this chaotic mess in your mind. And uh, that's how it was best described to me. And that, that analogy worked pretty well for me. So that's what we were doing. And uh, that's when I discovered the whole molestation part taking place. And I was like, okay, 
um, I called my cousin. We, we were able to have our phones a couple times a week where we, we can, for an hour, where we can call home. Um, the, the, it was really great. The facility had it set up. You could not access the internet. <laughs> it, was, it was like you were isolated. And that was actually good, too, because you needed that kind of commitment. And um, so there we were. I was talking. I called a cousin of mine. I was like, hey, um, I went through this session, this therapy session, and, and I had this memory, and this is what the memory was about. And he said, oh my God, Brian, I thought you were spared because we all thought that he was afraid of your dad. I was like, we all thought? What do you mean we all thought? <laughs> yeah, this son of a bitch. Yeah, every single grandchild. Now, here's the fact. Remember I told you I'd found out later in life that my father was forced to do this stuff and my aunts were. Mm -hmm. Why in the fuck would you allow me to be in the same vicinity of this monster. Yeah. If that happened to you. And the only thing, because my dad's gone and dad, he's passed on. We hadn't had, I didn't have really have a chance to talk to him about this because he had died in 2020. And here I was 2021. So um, I can only think that maybe he suppressed it so well that he totally put it back or because of his epilepsy and the trauma from the two years in Vietnam and his life trauma and everything else that it really did just fade from his memory, I guess. Because I would think that he would not put me in that position, I would hope. But then again, I also was dealing with a man who wasn't a very abusive and and really, so he was messed up. He was messed up. He was traumatically messed up himself. So I, I forgave my father. Um, my father asked for forgiveness when he was in his uh, 40s and after I got out of the Navy. And uh, um, we talked about service and stuff. And we could relate to things. Um and I, and I forgave him. We had a good, we had a good 15 year relationship there for a while. And then about three years before he died, he went off the deep end again and just got real belligerent. And then he started getting, um, uh, 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 Alzheimer's or Alzheimer's. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, dementia started yeah. dementia kicking in. And that was a, God bless my sister, my, my younger sister. She took care of him mostly. And, uh, she suffered his wrath a bit, but, and it sucked because, you know, she loved him. We loved him. He, he was a good man who went through a lot of hell and made a lot of bad mistakes, man. Yeah. But at the end, whenever he, we were at the hospital, it was COVID and he, he had finally had, he emaciated himself. He's down to 120 pounds, man. He's, you know, he's five, eight and I could pick him up off the bed, you know, no big deal. Um, <laughs> He had a heart attack, and uh, one of the stations, one of the departments I worked for, my, one of my first departments I worked for, actually ran him. Um, and uh, I was up at the hospital with him, and he's on this um, impeller to keep his heart going, and he's intubated. But he's conscious, though. So we're talking to him and letting him know that there's no way to save you now because, one, you're 74 years old, and your heart's so damaged that this impeller, they have to shut it off. They can't keep you on it. You're going to pass. So when we pull your tube out, we don't know how long you're going to be able to stay awake. But once you go unconscious, we're going to turn the impeller off. Are, are you ready to go be with God? And he was like, you know, what, am, what choice do I have? He's running his eye. Yeah. So when we took the the in a bit, the tube out, he was it was just me, my my one of my brothers and my sister. Um, my other brother was on a ship and out in the middle of the freaking ocean. So, um. He, he was able to speak to us with that voice that has a tube in it for 24 hours. Um, very sore throaty, croakly, but he, he was able to speak to us about how he loved the Lord, was ready to go to be with God in heaven, how he loved each one of us, for each of us to be good to each other and be good parents, and how he loved his the, the wives he was married to and asked for forgiveness for anything he did. And then he just went to sleep. It was like three minutes of him talking and us just listening. And then he just closed his eyes and it was done. And they turned the impeller off and, you know, a minute later he's gone. And, and I was on the same side of the bed holding the same hand as I was with my wife three years prior, you know, four, well, no, 16 to 24 years prior. So I'm reliving that. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, this is great. You know, they say, uh, I thought the job would prepare me to uh, see, because I've seen a lot of death, you know, in, the, in that short career of mine. I've seen a, a lot of death. But, it's uh, not the same. It's not. It's not. I, yeah, it really isn't. So, um, th there, he, but I do say he had a glorious death. He was able to make amends. And, and I know he's up there telling Jesus what he did wrong while he was down here on earth. Because <laughs> my dad studied the Bible tons of times. And he actually, he actually wrote a book himself. We just haven't have it published. It's an amazing book. I need to see about trying to get it published. But as one of his things he asked me to do on his deathbed, here I am. Um, 
So anyways, uh, we're dealing with all that. So here I am uh, with the molestation stuff. My cousin telling me, hey, you know, uh, I thought you were spared, but no. And he goes, that's exactly what he did to us too, Brian. Wow. That was a, that was a real freaking eye opener. You know, it was, it was, when I say eye opener, it was more like a shock or a, a realization of how did I suppress that so much? But I did. And, um, so how did it affect me? Um, that's what the counseling was talking to me about. And let's now let's see how this affected you and, and went on. Well, I was easily picked on one because I was always being beaten down by my old man. And then I had a couple of good friends that would defend me. You know, I got into a handful of fight, not even a handful, maybe four fights in my life before the Navy. And, uh, I barely, I can fight my way out of a paper bag, man, you know, but held my own through a little bit. Thank God for my friends who kept it fair. And, uh, they intervened when they had to, but, um, that was it. And, and so when I, I got into the Navy, um, here I was, uh, loving life, uh, wanting to be a, away from all this shit that I was growing up around. That's why I left so quickly. And um, I was at my first duty station, and uh, we had this thing called hazing. You know, you probably heard ne- about it. Never heard of it. Never heard of it. We don't have that in the fire service. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first hazing incident was uh, well known. It's called a pink belly. And, uh, there's 30 guys in our division, and this me and another guy came from the same A school, damage control A school, and we got put in repair division on the ship. And um, our division repair um, consists of damage controlmen, hull techs, and, and machine re- machine um, repairmen and stuff like the MRs, HTs, and DCs. And um, uh, so – am I doing good on time? Yeah, you're good, man. <laughs> um, so there's 30 guys in that in that division. And we're in these cubicles, we're in, in the birthing space. And they grab me and this other guy. I call him Buddy in the book. Um, me and Buddy, we get taken and held down, and our shirt's pulled up, and they each man comes in and slaps his hand, open hand on your stomach twice, you know, bam, bam, each hand. And 30 of them. <laughs> and the guys who are holding you down, they swapped them out, and they got to do theirs too. So you're welcome to, welcome to the art division. You've mm-hmm. just been pink bellied. Hey, thank you. All right, great. As much as it sucked, I was like, okay, cool. I can handle that. That's cool. Um, about, I'm one of the cool kids. <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm accepted, man. You know, this is all. I'm right. All right, so it's a well. lot better than my grandpa in the <laughs> Marine Corps, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. Let me let me ask you on that, though, Brian. Like that probably was the first group acceptance you had had ever, if not in a long time. At that point, wasn't it? Yeah, it really kind of was because I played football. I mean, I sucked at sports, buddy. I mean, I sucked at baseball. I, I'm Mexican and can't play soccer. <laughs> I, 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 I can't speak Spanish either. Like an I, Asian that can't do math. Right, right exactly. Left and right. I can't play. So I, I mean, I sucked bad. Um, so and the one year I tried. But uh, football, I could throw my body around. I could grab you, you know, and that kind of thing. I can get hit. Pain was nothing new to me. So I was like, all right. And it was kind of, I kind of liked it. But uh, that was about the most probably accepted I felt was, was you know, on a football team. At times, there was a camaraderie there, you know, but not like I not like it could have been it wasn't like we were you know friday night lights in texas football because you know here we are in the midwest up up farther north we're not we're not taking it as seriously back then as they did but that yeah you're right that was like the first acceptance of of that and not only that but when i graduated boot camp um i did everything that the navy asked me to do and i did it very well um in fact i was one of three guys who didn't get my chip pulled the whole time we were in boot camp which means when you get your chip pulled it means you didn't fold something right your a and b drawer weren't organized correctly or something and you had to go to mashing party which they took you at marching party they called it and they they called it mashing you where they pt you to death yeah <laughs> and so that last week we're getting ready for graduation like Call the three of us up. These guys never had their chits pulled. And it's like, yeah. And you're like, yeah, we're cool, man. We're, 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 we, we are superb. Get your fucking asses outside. And everyone, <laughs> every, every one of us who didn't get their chit pulled from every division, because there were seven of them, <laughs> we were all getting our asses beat worse than those guys ever went through shit. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, it was, that was a rite of passage. So I was walking 10 feet tall, man, when I graduated from boot camp and I did the freedom run and I finished it. And under the time it was needed to be finished, I was walking 10 feet tall. You know, came home, people noticed I was walking different. And uh, it, that was short lived though, because uh, once I got to that first duty station, then the second haziness and decided to come around. A um, bunch of guys grabbed me and Buddy and said, Hey, we need to talk to you. So let's go down, down below to the second deck. And down there was a machine repair shop. And in the machine repair shop, heavy machine repair shop, they had uh, these I beams up there on the ceiling and the, these chain hoists to, to be able to move these big heavy machinery from around the ship. 
Well, they shut the hatch behind us and they grabbed us, took duct tape, duct tape our wrists, duct tape our, our ankles, just pulled our pants and our skivvies down, picked us up and hung us upside down on these hooks. Now, thank God they didn't hang us with our hands behind our backs. So we're hanging up there like this and we're, we're detesting, we're cussing, we're yelling, what the fuck are you doing? And then another one goes over with the rubber glove, puts this big rubber glove on, goes to this five gallon drum and it's got this ball bearing grease in it and it's blue. And he has the glove on because this shit don't wash off. It wears off your skin. If you get it on your skin, it stains you. So he picks a big glob up, comes over, slaps a glob on my genitalia, slaps a glob on buddies. And they're like laughing and jovial. You just got blue balled. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. 18 years old, 128 pounds, had a 28 inch waist. I was just a kid, man. And these men were doing this shit to us and uh, thinking it was cool and funny and it was a rite of passage of some sort, but that's going too far. And so we were pissed. Luckily, I was 18 years old and 128 pounds, and I was able to reverse sit myself up and pull myself off the hook. Poor buddy, he was taller than me. He wasn't as agile, and I had to help him get off, and he was madder than a hornet. He swore to God none of this shit was going to happen again. I was like, yeah, I'm with you. And uh, again, a couple weeks after that, I'm coming off of what we call cranking because we every every new sailor has to go serve in uh, the mess galley or the officer's mess um, for the first 90 days of their attachment to your ship. You're assigned to your division, but you have to go work in the kitchen. Yeah. So I'm coming off of my um, shift up um, up on the officer's deck, and I'm going to my rack. Well, to describe to you real quick how the Navy works, we have birthing spaces, and they still do today. Um, and they're three racks high. The two racks on the bottom are called coffin lockers because you can lift your rack up with your three-inch mattress, and you have all this space to pack all your stuff and organize things in a drawer, and then you get one stand-up. Well, the guy who's newest, he gets in the very top rack that does not have a storage unit underneath it. It's just a flat piece of metal with a three-inch mattress, and you get two stand-up lockers. So I'm a new guy going up on top. And so I'm trying to get into there, and these two guys come from my division, and um, they are um, they're two black guys, and they had a couple black friends with them from another division that I didn't know, and that's going to play a part. I, I, I hate saying racial stuff because people think I'm racist and I'm not, but um, well, it plays a part because the thought process that took place. They come to me, hey, pretty motherfucker. I think, what you doing, pretty boy? And all that kind of stuff. I'm like, man, just leave me alone, man, okay, please. And they grab me, and I think he needs a spanking. This guy needs a whooping, you know? And they pull me across into the other cubicle, which is identical to mine, just opposite. And as they're pulling me in there, they're, 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 they're hitting me, they're beating me, they're pushing me down the ground, they're pulling my pants, they're undoing my, I hear the buckle of my pants hitting the linoleum. They're smacking my bare ass, whipping me. I'm screaming, yelling, let me go. And then this, Second class petty officer comes in. He's a real big dude. He's a white guy. Had this freaking Lorac mustache and shit. And and he was Irish. And I knew these guys just briefly because I'd only been there for maybe a month at this point now. And as you know, I'm artistically gifted. And I was drawing cartoons of everybody to be to make friends. You know, that's how I made my friends was draw pictures of them in cartoons and stuff. So I had all these guys, you know, and this I, I still have this picture at home, this drawing I did of the division. And I've got the two guys that were involved in my incident here in that picture as a cartoon character of them. And um, so th- this guy comes over, as I say, I'm trying not to mention names. This guy comes over and I thought he was going to stop it. He's a big dude. Um, no, he grabs my shoulders and leans down into me and smiles as I'm looking up at him. He smiles and they're continuing to beat my ass, hit me in the back punch me, do whatever they want. They're, they're just having fun. And one of them said, somebody needs to fuck this motherfucker. And one of them decided to violate me. So as I'm being violated by one and being held down and hit and beaten, all I can hear is that buckle on that linoleum floor. <laughs> and I focus on that. <laughs> I'm like, I got to fucking think about just this, man. Because I'm dying. <laughs> I'm dying. And I just wanted to die. And everything went into slow motion. Everything went into sound just died out. You know, like became muffled. And 
And I'm just focusing on that fucking, you know, and then the door opens on the side of the birthing space. And the guy who was holding my shoulders down, he goes to investigate who that is. And of course, now it's scramble time to, you know, get their cells picked up. And the only one who had to really get himself organized was the one who took his pants down too. And the other two, they all started running. The other two guys who I didn't know who were in my division, they took off. And then the guys who were in mine, they come up. And the last guy to get off of me, he leans down in my ear and he says, you say a fucking thing to anybody, I will fucking kill you. Now, this is a, a black dude that I don't know. <laughs> the only thing I knew about him was he's from some hard-ass part of this country. And Navy was a choice versus jail. <laughs> so I'm scared. You know, I believe him. And uh, I pull my shit up and I, I get into my cubicle and I crawl up into my rack and curl up like a fucking baby and just weep. Um, so now I'm trying to keep things under control. I don't know what to do. My mind is where I'm like, am I a man? Am I gay? Uh, am I a pussy? Am I, what am I? And it's like, I'm like, I'm nothing. You know, they, but I just want to go home. <laughs> I just want to go home. <laughs> and, and I'm like, fuck. I was so, I was walking 10 feet tall two months before, three months before, you know, four months before my graduation movie, I was walking 10 feet tall. Nah. So uh, there I am. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I got I to gotta fake it till I make it, man. So, you know, but I'm on edge, man. You talk about hyper vigilant, man. I'm waiting for somebody to come out of every fucking corner down a passageway. I'm waiting for somebody to, to pull me aside, do something. And uh, I went to a repair locker um, and I grabbed the dog wrench and I stole it and put it in my rack. And um, another few days goes by. It's about another week or so. And the two gentlemen that were from, gentlemen, fucking two assholes that were from my, my division that, that violated me, one, one of them that violated me and helped beat me, come up to me again and say, hey, pretty boy, want another grant? And, and I grabbed that fucking dog wrench out of my, underneath my rack with all the fucking strength I had, and I smacked that son of a bitch back, of course, from each rack. Bam, 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 just real loud as fuck. Get the fuck away from me. I will fucking kill you. Underneath the two bottom bunks, there are two shipmates of mine, curtains simultaneously, whoosh come back man what the fuck is going on <laughs> and they back off and go away right I'm so sorry they go back and go away um so they're like what's wrong what's up i was like nothing i'm so sorry I woke you guys up and uh, and then i left it at that um there was racial tension back then <laughs> in the in the late 80s early 90s um still there was still a bit of a little bit of segregation going on i didn't quite understand it but, you know, the 60s weren't that far before, man, you know, 20 years prior, you know. So. And when you're living in it, you don't know until you look back. Right, at it. right, right. Well, and, and, and in fact, though, back home, my family were very bigoted. My 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 Mexican grandmother and my, my half Indian, half white grandfather and, well, my parents too. The N-word was, was tossed around like in a new rap song these days, man. You know, and it's like, I didn't know nothing. I mean, I didn't even really think that was a bad word you know, or derogatory when I was little. I learned later it was, of course. Yeah. And I never did it. I never, I didn't, I did use it amongst family members and friends, not realizing what the hell it was. And once I started realizing what it was about, I was res resigned from using it. Um, I had no problems with anybody, man. I didn't care if you were black, white, or I just had friends. I had, I had friends of all kinds of races. I didn't care. You know, I'm, I'm a kind of hard dude. I just wanted to be fun loving and outgoing, but here I am growing up in this, in this, in this life, in this, this traumatic life that I didn't realize was traumatic. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> you, can... you didn't know any different. Right. So I go, I go up to the, um, the, the, I'm trying to, you know, cliff notes this. It's more in detail in the book, but I go up to uh, the mess, the mess galley and we were tasked with doing laundry for the officers and making them breakfast and stuff like that. And I got pretty good at cooking, you know, making eggs and omelets and shit. And so I'm up in a mess galley, and this new kid, good-looking kid, man, just a nice, innocent kid. He's just fresh out of high school, sitting in a chair, and he's black. <laughs> and I walk in, and he looks at me, and I, I must have looked at him like he was a jerk or something. I don't know, but he looked at me and was like, what are you fucking, you know, like, what's your fucking problem? And I said, shut up, N-word. And it was on. He comes out of that chair and he's, we're, we're rolling. We're, we're going after it. And I was ready to just explode. I didn't care. 
And I finally was able to maneuver myself around him and push him into the griddle and bend him over. And as I'm trying to push his head to the griddle, thank God I didn't because the petty officer who was in charge of me, he came and I felt his arm go around my throat and pull me off of him and threw me out of the hatchway into the passageway onto the deck. Now, everything's made of steel on a ship, remember? So it was not a pleasant. There's no soft landings, yeah. (laughs) So, and he comes out of there and he's like, and he shuts the hands behind him. What the fuck is going on? And I just lost it. And he's like, get up, get up and calm yourself down. And I said, I've been fucking raped, man. And he's like, what? Took me into the freaking shop where we belonged. And I explained the whole thing that happened to him. And just his facial expression told me the story he was thinking. He immediately took me off the ship, put me to the Naval Investigative Services at, in, on the East Coast at the base I was at. And um, the ball started rolling from there. You know, um, uh, I went home on emergency leave. Um, those guys were brought in. They were questioned. Uh, I found out later uh, several of them were discharged from the Navy. Um, I ended up having to go back to my ship. The captain wanted to see me. He's telling me that I'm going to go back to my division. I'm going to pretend this never happened. Just get on with your life. Reason why I found that out that he was doing that is he was a he was a pilot because this was a this ship I was on was an LPH. It was a landing pad helo at the time, so uh, he had been in the program to try and get in with NASA and like most pilots, military pilots try to do. And there was no way he wanted to have this on his fucking record on his command's record, you know. Yeah. So um, I was like, well, with all due respect, sir, no, I'm not. And I walked out of his office. He must have been in shock. This 18 year old kid basically told him to fuck himself because I went went straight off the freaking ship, went straight to that NIS um, agent and told him what the hell was going on. And they got a hold of my recruiter. My dad, I got hold back home. My dad got a hold of the recruiter. Recruiter's talking to people. Next thing I know, I'm being told to go to uh, a detailer that I'm going to be getting sent to another ship. Well, I got sent to another ship up further east coast. Um, I was in Virginia at Norfolk, and then I got sent up to Connecticut, up to uh, New London. So <laughs> I'm like, all right, cool. Now, mind you, there's a lot of stuff I'm leaving out. Um, I did have my ex-wife with me because I'd gone home. I brought her home back with me. Um, again, that was the first time I saved somebody. I was saving her from her family. Uh, she was in a dysfunctional family, and she wanted to leave and run home. So I took her with me for selfish reasons as well, not thinking that they were selfish at the time because I was going to be her hero and take her away from this. Mm -hmm. But she was also somebody that I was uh, being intimate with. And guess what I like to do when I'm stressed out, you know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, um, let's go. And we got married so we could stay, so she could stay in school because we put her in high school. Give her kudos where kudos is due. She was a young 18-year-old or 17-year-old girl. I had to sign for because I was 18. Um, she graduated on the honor roll. She worked. She tried to keep a little house and was married. So God bless her. She did a hell of a job <laughs> being that young <laughs> and, and kicking ass. Um, so anyways, she was there too, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll allude away from that because it's not that pertinent to the story now. Um, so here I am on, going to this new ship, and with my orders that I have, uh, they gave me an envelope, a sealed envelope, the um, uh, what we call those, uh, the... Uh, um, office personnel the personnel man pn the personnel man um gave me this said here you hand this to your next pn at the next command okay cool and i did and they were like well, where's your where's your medical record where's your personnel record oh yeah all, all that's in here is your pay record <laughs> i was like they just gave me a sealed envelope my medical record and my personnel file came later after it was added all the stuff to it the my medical examination that took place the uh, other parts of the investigation all that stuff was put in a personnel file and they were also warned the people, uh, the new command I went to, that our division was warned, do not fuck with this guy. And so that put a bad taste in a bunch of their mouths. <laughs> it, yeah, it typically doesn't go well mm-hmm. whenever someone is getting special treatment. Right. So I don't get to be hazing one. But I did get to crank some more because on those days of my cranking that, that took place like a month or so, I didn't get that credited to me. I went another 90 days, and this time I was in the mess galley. And it's much worse than the officer's galley, so <laughs> I got to suffer for that for a while. But um, I eventually uh, made some friends. Um, one did not care for me particularly um, from the beginning because of that. And on one incident, um, uh, a few months into it, he decided to trip me as I was going through, or push me as I was going through a hatch for a morning muster meeting. 
And uh, because of the hatch, I caught my foot and I went down to the deck. And as he's stepping over me and laughing and going into the other room, the other the space in the meeting area, we have a shop, you know. And then we had this like area we could watch TV and do training. He walked into that. I immediately got up, went over to the, the workbench, grabbed the pipe wrench, went straight into the freaking room, and didn't say nothing to nobody. And as he turned around, as I'm yelling, I'm going to kill you, I'm going to end you, or some shit like that, as I'm just wide eyed and deviled eyed and ready to fucking kill somebody. And I got tackled by a couple guys. And the petty officer in charge is like, can't ignore this. Have to report this. Me and this other dude end up in front of the captain. <laughs> and then the captain somehow, because it's called Captain's Mass. And for this infringement, because, you know, fighting's against the UCMJ. So if you violate any rules of the UCMJ, Uniform Code of Military Justice, you're going before the man, you know, yep. and get some punishment. Well, we got restricted to the ship for three days. And we had to, because I was, so I don't know how this happened, man. He knew I could draw. So he's like, you're going to make some PSA posters on how to get along at sea. <laughs> I, shit you, I shit you not. You had to draw a get along shirt. <laughs> I drew cartoons of sailors g- getting along, like little dep- like comic book stuff, you know, how to get along out at sea with each you, other. You know what, though? He had to help me color it. <laughs> he, he, was, he was not a happy camper. Here's what I'll say. Well, I'll, I will say this about that captain, though. He put you in a place where you could succeed. That's true. That's true. He did. He did. Um, that, was, that was an experience. Um, eventually the ship was old enough. We had to decommission her. We already done the Gulf war. We'd, we'd gone over to service for the Gulf war and back and didn't see nothing. I mean, I was in the Navy. I was very blessed. I didn't have to deal with any combat trauma and stuff like that. The, the worst thing that we dealt with was, uh, give, donate blood, see a bunch of body bags coming on board and knowing that they were going to be used. There was an anticipation that there was, was going to be a bloody, bloody war. And it turned out to be, what, three or four days long, technically, really. Um, yeah. And there was some loss of life and whatnot, but mostly on their side. Um, so we were done with all that. Um, we had to decommission the ship, and then I got assigned to another ship. Um, that back down in Norfolk, but in Little Creek this time. Not Norfolk, back down in Virginia, but in Little Creek. So this was an amphibious assault ship. In the LSD, um, we said it stood for large sitting duck because if you look at an LSD online, they got this big square box superstructure in the front of the ship, but they have a well deck where they carry LCACs underneath, where we have four LCACs that can maintain. They carry tanks and Marines and stuff onto lands. Those LCACs have made 90% of the beaches in the world accessible, whereas before with the old duck boats and stuff, it wasn't that way. Yeah. So um, it was a cool ship, you know, cool thing. It's a new beginning. All right, and I'm still reeling from my trauma, okay? Even though it's a year, almost two years later and stuff, I'm still reeling from this stuff. And um, and the whole racial part of it was because there was racial tensions back then, I thought my assault was a racial deal. I thought they were targeting me because of my because I was not black or because I was white. Um, and then whenever Green was involved, oh, I'm sorry. Well, yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, nobody's going to know. But whenever the, the other guy was involved, the big white guy, well, there was a white guy there too. Well, guess what? I wasn't fond of big white dudes with mustaches either. <laughs> but um, yes, <laughs> I. And the cool thing about K Man, like I said before, uh, my next command where we tested together, K Man didn't even know he was doing this. He was such a funny guy, dude. Uh, I got to hanging out with him, doing doing jobs and stuff. He brought me back to the reality that. Just because of color of somebody's skin and there was a bad apple in this group doesn't make the whole freaking batch bad. Doesn't make it doesn't make everybody who's the same color a bad person. So it brought me back to my reality. And I think that was all trauma based. You know, just didn't realize it back then because I didn't know. Right. And so he helped me be at peace with um the fact that these were just bad people. It didn't matter what color they were. Yeah. So that was nice. So I got over that little hump. Um, but then, you know, we, 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 we were doing with the ship. And, and so the guys on the ship, they didn't know about my past. And it was nice because these ones weren't worn. They didn't. But, of course, I'd been in the Navy long enough. I wasn't getting hazed. I was already a third-class petty officer going for a second. I was an E-4 going for E-5. So I was in charge of a repair locker. I was on scene leader, all that kind of stuff. I was qualified to do all kinds of things. And I, I, I actually excelled at my in my job. I loved firefighting, man. I love, I still love it. I miss it so bad. But, um, uh, so one day the guys are wrestling around. I mean, it's, I mean, it's, I'm already, I'm almost done with my hitch. I'm, I'm, I'm almost four years in at this point. And they're, they're horsing around, wrestling around. We're, we're 
were overseas in the Mediterranean. And they grabbed me in because usually I just kind of steer clear of it, but they grabbed me into it. And I was like, all right, all right, you know, just it's okay. Let's go. And then they got me down and my buckle hit the fucking William. I blacked out. I remember a flash of me throwing a chair and I think I hit one of them <laughs> with it, but they were pissed and somebody grabbed me, held me down. I was foaming at the mouth, kind of mad and upset. And they were really upset and wondering what the fuck was my problem. And I felt horrible about it after that. So about two months prior, I had my wisdom teeth extracted and I had a whole bunch of, the military likes to give you Motrin, 500 milligram, 1,000 milligram Motrin and shit. Oh yeah, it fixes everything. <laughs> yeah. Change your socks, yeah. drink water. And But for me, because I had a dry socket, they did it to prescribe some, I can't remember what it was back then, some sort of pain reliever of some sort of narcotic possibly. Um, I took them all. I, I took everything I had left and I, I did leave a note saying that I was um, done. You know, couldn't, I was sorry, but so I, I did. Well, <laughs> that was my first attempt at killing myself. And uh, the next thing I had was a flash of, because uh, I was on shift, we were on, on duty. We had a fire drill, and I was supposed to report to this fire drill, and I didn't show up, so they came and got me and found me. I had flashes going through the passageway with a couple, under, a couple guys' arms. Um, then the next flash I remember was being in a commode, um, being forced to drink some chocolate or some charcoal of some sort. And then um, being in the bed and in medical and then taken off the ship. And then I was finally aware that, okay, I'm leaving the ship now. And I went into a, a main hospital inland. And then from there, I went to another country, went to Italy and then from Italy to Germany and then from Germany to Canary Islands fuel up. And then we hit Dover. And from Dover, um, I ended up at Fort Gordon, Georgia, and I spent 30 days there in psych ward, and it's an army base for it, but I was there being evaluated by psychiatrist and or psychologist, psychiatrist, whatever. Um, and I was diagnosed with PTSD um, in my medical record, and, and uh, they were going to discharge me. And I was like, uh, you can discharge me all you want, cause, but this time I was in for like three years, eight months. <laughs> and I was like, I ain't signing nothing on papers unless I get an honorable, because I didn't do anything wrong, man. I served my country, and I got fucked over, and you guys didn't handle it right. And... They gave me an honorable, it was an honorable discharge, but with an RE3G code, reenlistment code, which means um, not, uh, not eligible for reenlistment um, due to non-physical reasons, you know, some sort of jab or jaw like that. You have to get a waiver. Yeah. Because my intentions were to go ahead, because I just wanted to be a military man. I wanted to serve my country. I wanted to be a service. I always had a servant's heart. And I didn't get to. Um, uh, I went to go reenlist into the uh, National Guard, and they were like, can't unless you get a waiver. <laughs> and so I ditched that and just started going to police departments, fire departments and stuff like that. And uh, hoping that that wouldn't matter, the RE3G code, and as long as they saw the honorable. And so what I would do is I would hand in a copy of my DD-214 and I would highlight with a yellow highlighter the honorable and <laughs> my name and a couple <laughs> other places. And I kind of scraped the freaking copy of the deal where the RE3G code, where you couldn't really make it out unless you really tried. <laughs> So, you know, and it, it didn't work anyway. Um, it did later. But uh, so I tried getting on with that other department and then the whole, you know, um, I gave up and was in the construction and all that stuff. And uh, then there I am. So uh, I finally got hired on um, to a small department in 2012. And I stayed there two and a half years, um, worked part time for I worked full time there for nine months of it. The rest of it was part time. Because I got picked up with another department up in the uh, northern part of the um, metro area on the Kansas side of things. And I worked there for uh, a couple of years and then we were taken over by another department. And that we thought that was going to be a great thing, but it really wasn't. Um, then trouble started from there um, after my wife had cancer and died and, and things. And, and that's where we're at. So um, I guess really time to do a real gloss of my life. That's a lot of stuff, man. Um, the, I mean, it's like, it's like, that's how come I said, <laughs> that's the fucking understatement <laughs> of the podcast, Brian. <laughs> well, I'm like, I can't make this shit up if I try, dude. I wouldn't want to wish this on anybody. And I always wondered why did, I kept wondering, I told my girlfriend the other day, because we've been studying a lot of uh, energy work and universe um, 
um, connectivity, what is God, what is God, who's God, you know, that, that kind of adventure in my head, I'm trying to really kind of, in the psilocybin trip um, with the therapy psilocybin trip, it was a really eye-opening to all those subject matters. But um, so I'm sitting there, I'm like, I think I finally realized, because I would always ask myself, what did I do to deserve this? Am I, am I paying from the sins of the father, you know? Um, I didn't, I didn't ask to be born into this family. I didn't ask to be treated this way. I didn't ask for my, you know, for him, that, that monster to do what he did to us. I didn't ask for, um, so what the hell? And I guess because I was raised in that negative, I'm feeling like this is why, because I really do want to believe God wouldn't punish somebody unnecessarily or, or whatnot. So that negative life that I lived in just drew negativity like a magnet. You know, because how can somebody have that much bad luck? I mean, I, I get we all have things to to deal with and crosses to bear, but goddamn, man. I mean, I was like, I didn't realize until later in life after COE when I started really recounting my life that I really did have some crazy shit happening pretty periodically. So now what's pretty fucking appropriate for my name now because it really was my whole life. Yeah. And so I'm like, okay, <laughs> so what do we do from here? Now what? Now what do we do? And so I'm at counseling, I'm learning, and they're learning all this stuff about me. And that's what they were, the, the, they were, that's what they were figuring out. Why was the calls and why was your wife's death and why was all this taking place? Why were you coping with them in unhealthy ways? Well, Jesus Christ, my whole freaking life, I've been dealing with traumatic life experiences and not being taught or known how to freaking cope with those in a healthy manner. So I just played par for course and didn't realize I was doing stupid shit until it, the, the, I hit the wall. And... So I was like, okay, um, now we know why. So what do we do here? Well, I'm going to tell you, brother, uh, that first, uh, when you're in that fight and flight mode and you're at work and you're just all the time, that part of your brain, you know, we talked about the brain, how it gets affected. That frontal lobe, when I was at the first camp, I went to a warrior's ascent camp, okay, for five days. Fantastic. fantastic. It's a fantastic, yes, yeah, a fantastic organization, fantastic week. Um, that was given to me, or that was told for me to go through that whole ordeal of the uh, peer support, mm -hmm. and, you know, because, and this was about two months after three, Nikki died in August, and I was at that, I was cohort 13, and it was in um, uh, February of the 17. So I was there for that week, and we had a uh, neurologist come in, and he's, you know, brain expert, and he's telling us that when you were in a depressive mode or state, you know, your blood flow isn't flowing all the way through the entirety of your brain. It's not like, you know, excessively going to the frontal lobe and stuff. It's being drawn back because you're in this fight or flight mode coming down to your medulla inglobata or whatever. <laughs> medulla oblonga. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, where then where then where then crocodiles have all them teeth yeah. and they got a toothbrush. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so any, <laughs> anytime we can have a water boy reference on the podcast, I'm there for it. <laughs> yeah, you know, yo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's awesome. Dude. Laughter is so good for healing, man. <laughs> uh, so, anyway. Uh, there, there we are. You know, um, where was I at? Um, Warriors Ascent. Yeah, Warriors Ascent. Uh, alligators with no teeth. That's right. <laughs> so this this neurologist is telling us about that, and he goes, "What happens is when you're in a depressive motor state, and here I am, depressed over the death of my wife, and and then uh, um, you can't learn something new. You can you can retain what you already know, but you're not going to be able to maintain and retain new information until you're able to breathe, meditate, um, let the let the what he would call cellular brain damage can be re can be healed by more blood flow by more relaxation by more releasing of stress and getting out of that fight or flight mode and just being overall calm so that your brain can affect and work and you do that enough you'll you'll regain the ability to maintain information well this was important for me at this time because when i was all done with that week of learning how to eat great and uh deal with pressure and, and stuff a wonderful program wonderful program I was back and I, and I, I was the, the, the department I worked for were like, okay, you need to be a driver. Okay. And it's one of the only departments that f makes everyone be a driver, no matter what. And if you don't, you're going to lose your job. I'm like, okay, thanks guys. Appreciate that. Um, so 
you need to test on your streets and stuff. So I was testing and I was like memorizing these words and stuff. And man, I could test on things before and do kick ass, but I wasn't maintaining the information, you know, and then until I really afterwards and I started doing the, the yoga and the meditation and then boom, I was able to remember. And I took all 109 thoroughfare streets and I memorized them so well that when I, they gave me the test, I flipped it over at the kitchen table and I had one of the, one of my guys who worked with me, um, he was sitting there watching me and I wrote down every freaking hundred block and every name behind it. And then I just kept flipping back and forth the paper and answering the questions. Cause they were different kinds of fill in the blanks, you know, hundred yeah. percent. Awesome. And even he said, that was impressive. <laughs> I was like, got it down now, man. Cool. Um, got through that. And then they were like, okay. Um, I was having some difficulties remembering a few things on, on, uh, um, pump operations and stuff and um, went to the class did great in the first time in the class um, it had been a, um, because of my wife's conditions and stuff and she was worsening my captain and his wisdom at the time was like we're going to hold off on letting you drive so another year went by and then another year went by and then she dies and then they're like, well, now you need to get your stuff, so we're going to put you back in the class. No excuse. Yeah. Your yeah. wife's now dead. You have to drive. <laughs> yeah. God. <laughs> well, uh, 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 <laughs> I mean, you've had a free ride for three fucking years, Brian. <laughs> right. <laughs> so that, that, That's kind of true. That's true. But <laughs> with that being said, I'm going to say this. Um, because people who are going to see this or hear this, um, the guys I worked with, superb. Superb. Supported me. Brothers. Brotherhood. Though They were there, man. They were there. Um, administration wise, um, when it gets up to the white shirts that are, aren't, are in the ditches with us, a little different, a little mm-hmm. different attitude. And this is why I think this happened because I was outed by my pissed off affair and it was put on a website for everybody to see. And I had several brothers, Hey man, this is on this website. And it's like a website that's like not for celebrities, but it's kind of like it, putting dirt on people, you know, and anybody can post something on there and just uh, get away with it. it, you know, just make shit up. I can post oh. something about you and just, hey, you'd have to go fight this guy to get this stuff off your website. You mean you know? Wikipedia? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right, like that, exactly. Um, but this one was being spread around and it was, you know, such and such, fireman, Brian Minnick, cheating on dying, because they, they, they on, on, the, on the website, they listed the county that I worked for. Of course. And so because of that, it's not too hard to figure out because my name and then the county, I guess you can narrow it down to who I worked for. So I can imagine a couple of the people in the min- and admin were like, <sighs> now here's the deal. Being a swinger or, you know, having slept with a prostitute, <laughs> that's dirty. You know, you're, you're a dirty motherfucker. I'm not the first person in the fire service to have an affair on his wife. Now, mind you, mine was sanctioned, and people can believe it or not, but the two oldest kids we had, we cleared that shit with them before it all happened. And the reason why I think my wife wanted to do that was to make sure if things ever did come out, they knew the truth. Our lifestyle was, it fit for us. It worked for us. You can agree with it. You can disagree with it. I don't care. I don't judge anybody what they do behind closed doors and what they, what they want to do. Um, but if I was gay, if I'd have been gay, I'd have been paraded around the whole freaking city that, you know, we got a gay fireman. What I should have done back then, if I'd have been smart and I could have started this whole freaking, I'm identifying as, <laughs> because if I would have identified as something or non binary or whatever, now you're going to discriminate against me. Now I could really have you by the balls, but I didn't because that's not me. And I owned my shit. And what, what does this have to affect? I didn't, it didn't affect my work capabilities. I was doing a good job. My evals were all good. So the people I worked with, for the majority, there's always a handful of people who don't like you, but, you know, wherever you're at, but the majority of them did. So why are you targeting me for <laughs> wanting to pressure me into more shit? But that's the admin side. The admin side's probably like, we got to get some shit on this guy. We need to get rid of him. Let's build up a, a dossier on him or a profile on him because we got to be careful how we fire him because... You know, lawsuits are involved, which a lawsuit was involved. Um, so here I am going through the testing, whatnot, and and I pass everything. It was really crazy, brother, because the first PIP they put me on, man, they they told me, look, we're gonna put you on PIP. You're gonna go train on the on the engines and stuff. And we had CAF system. You guys familiar with CAFs? Mm. Compressed air foam. Yeah, yeah, it's 
It's yeah. It's it was fun. like, oh, this is the new greatest thing, and then it was, oh, that's not so great. <laughs> yeah. Well, I could teach the damn class. I'd been through it so much and spent so many hours on it through my PIPs and everything. Um. So, anyways, I'm doing my my PIP and I'm going out and doing training, man. We like went out like nine times just to take the truck out, running through the scenarios. Well, every single time did I make a mistake here and there? Yeah, it, it's training. That's what this is for. Yeah, you're supposed to make mistakes in training. Yeah, and so there was a couple that were debatable because, for instance, on the calf system, um, when you engage calves, you know, it's in, engaging the gear, so you can't have the engine high idle. So when you engage it, then you idle up the motor, idle up the engine. It's all push-button electronic, you know, yeah. presets. So I disengaged calves because I was, they were giving me a scenario of I got guys inside, they have calves that's going, they're spraying. And now I got to disengage and give water. Well, I just disengaged the calf system. I didn't idle down the, the freaking engine. Why would I idle down the pump when I got guys inside? <laughs> you know? So, and it's set, a pre, it's a preset, it's 100 PSI. So they're going to have 100 PSI, you know, on, their, on the end of their nozzle. They're going to handle just fine. I just disengage the foam in the air. Now I got to adjust because it will drop a little, but it's not going to go down to nothing. Then I can adjust up to 120 or whatever. Um, I was reprimanded, not reprimanded, but one of the other firemen who was there, who I wasn't too fond of anyway, he, uh, said that he failed me on that. Mind you, this is training. This is not test. So nine of them took place. I get down, I go to my three month test and they told me if you, if you pass the engine test, the pump operations test on your three month deal, you'll be done. We'll be good. And we'll just get on with life, man. Cool. So I go to my three month test. I got an engine set up. I'm going to, they want me to, to uh, hook up the LDH. So I park the engine, I hook up the LDH. They, they pull a line, they pull an uh, inch, uh, inch and three quarter line into the training center and they pull off a mercury line too. So and the whole thing is, is I hook up the LDH, get up to the engine, get it running, get the, you know, before the pump water um, pump runs out, get the uh, inch and three quarter running good. And then they want me to get the, the deluge, the, um, cannon to go mm-hmm. and then they want me to get the mercury going and of course you gotta do that dance with the pump and you gotta adjust yeah. everything and it's all possible well okay I get over there I'm doing it and my captain comes over and he says hey cause we have a um, auto key you know the elect- electronic keystone which I hate because <laughs> they yeah. fuck up Yeah. well I hit the button hit the button it's not fucking going and opening the keystone for this and my, my tank water's le- leaving me and my captain's standing by me remember I want you to get that deck gun I know I walk around and I grab the speed key, manually open up that son bitch, boom, it kicks it down. We're good to go. Then I do everything else I need to do, and then my captain stood there and said, "Good job. I didn't know you could do that." He'd only pumped one fire. I found out in his career before he became a captain and didn't have to, or a lieutenant, I think, when he finally became a lieutenant, and he wasn't really on the pump anymore. So. Um, I'm like, cool, man, thanks. And the, and the battalion chief I had there who'd put me on this piano, he didn't put me on it. I know the admin did, but he was in charge of putting me on. Yeah. Um, who had told me that at three months before I passed my test, it'd be great. Everybody involved, everybody was rooting for me. Everybody, and I felt like, oh, God, thank God, man. I got this monkey off my back. I can get on with my career. Awesome. <laughs> so I passed. And not only did I pass, but I passed with manhand- or handling an actual failure from the pump itself that couldn't be predicted. So if that happened on a real scene, I just proved I can do it, <laughs> you know? And my captain's words were, I didn't know you could do that. <laughs> and that's awesome. So cool. So we go there and, and <laughs> I'm, um, I'm, I'm elated, man. I am elated. I'm finally, I think that's probably one of the happiest moments right there at that moment I'd had since way before my dealing with what was going on with my wife. So I get back in the next shift, you know, we go on four day, come back next shift. And generally, you know, if you're, you're ready to start driving, they're going to put you on, on the list, you know, on the board. And I go up there and I'm not on the board. And they're like, well, chief wants to see you downstairs. Go down and see my BC and my captain. And they're like, well, you know, we're going to go ahead and send you to another station. And they're going to, over there, one of the guys is one of the pump instructors, you know, and, and we're going to see how this goes for you for another three months. And I thought I was done. I passed. And he goes, no, well, out of the nine times we went out, you only passed five of them. I go, that's training. What do you mean I pass five? That's just training. I could debate some of these guys' decisions to fail me. Who was failing me? I didn't know I was being tested every single time I went out on the freaking training when you have a test for me. What does not make sense here? You know, and I was getting upset, but they're like, just doing it fine. I just got one. I was just, just fine. 
I'll go over here and do this. And I did. I went over to that station. <laughs> the guy who was my instructor twice in the class took me out. Let's see what you got going on. We played with the pumps. He's like, what's the problem? I said, I don't know. You tell me, Scott. <laughs> I'm like, you fucking tell me. And so that's when the whole rigor more started. Like, Am I being targeted? What the hell's going on? So I get through that three months. Another time in one of my training tests, I had a preset. Um, when we have it on preset, they have a, uh, um, on your calves, when, you auto, when your tank gets to half, it automatically starts to autofill because on the LDH that's coming in, there's this, another smaller valve that opens up and does an autofill. Well, that wasn't working. So I had to crack open and feed. And, and my lieutenant at the time, awesome dude, freaking great guy. I love this guy. He was, always, he was fair. This guy was a fair guy. Awesome firefighter. You'd love to have him on your department. Um, he, he's standing there watching me. He goes, hmm, what you doing? I said, autofill's not working. Hold on. You know, I'm adjusting, da-da-da. Okay, got it all done. Got everything running like it's supposed to run. Okay, let's shut it down. Let's do that again. Let's see what's going on. And we did it, and it, re it replicated the problem. Did it again. And then it worked, and then did it again. And then it didn't work. And it's like, okay, we're going to write this up. Good job. And he wrote it in the whole freaking report thing. Good job. that I overcame another fucking thing without freaking out or doing it. Thank you. So um, I get past all that. We get done with the test, the six-month PIP, and I'm back at my other station. And I told my battalion chief, you know, I really put you guys through a lot, man. I've been here a lot. Um, been here for three years at this, this station. You have guys supported me, but it might be time for me to change, to try and start over. And maybe I should go to another station to transfer it out. And so they agreed. And I told the guys, I, I met with the guys at, uh, in the day room, and, uh, at the dinner table. And I told them, I, I, I was emotional because I was like, I thank you for all your support. But um, I think it'd probably be best if I kind of give you guys a break, <laughs> you know. And um, I think some of them were like hurt by that because they had been backing me the whole time and they wanted me. They wanted me to succeed. They wanted me to be a part of this team because they knew my passion. They knew my love and they knew me. They knew who I was as a, as a, as a brother and a fireman. And so uh, I ended up going to the other station. And, and of course, now here I am with a different dynamic. I was with a bunch of like-minded guys at this station. Now I go to a station where I'm dealing with the opposite um, spectrum of thought processing. <laughs> and uh, I wasn't liked. And um, I blow an address on, after several calls, uh, I ended up blowing an address. I just had a brain fart, man. Um, then they want to test me again. I curb checked a, a Quint going through a roundabout. I told him, I think I'm going to catch the curb. Hold on. It didn't hurt the truck. Didn't do anything. Just barely caught the, 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 the curb. I went and bought ice cream. You know, coming out of the grocery store, I, there's a real small turn there at the grocery store. And I turned and I, I said, I'm going to run over that curb too a little bit. And I did. No big deal. But because of those two things in the same day, first time I curb checked anything in six years, um, since I started driving fire trucks at that time, I'm called in the office and be like, what's going on? What's wrong? <laughs> I'm like, I bought ice cream. What do you mean? What's wrong? <laughs> I, I, I'm supposed to buy ice cream. I did. And it's like, okay. So yeah. Um, they decided to say, hey, we're going to test you again, so we're going to put you on another PIP, and this time you need to score 80% or higher or you're going to lose your job. Well, what do you mean? And I was getting real emotional, and they're like, well, we're going, um, this lieutenant's going to put together this freaking testing system for you. Now, I've been at this station with these guys five or six months at this point, and I'm like, all right, because I've just been there since February or whatever, and this is getting into May. And... um. Well, not even that long, four months, whatever. So, uh, and I knew all these guys because, you know, when you work at a department, you end up working shifts over time and stuff. So I, I knew them all, um, was close with a couple of them, but didn't realize. And I didn't know that uh, the other, a couple of others did not really like me for like political reasons. Or, and, and my opinion on abortion was not, <laughs> you know, I haven't experienced with that in my life. Um, I'm pretty much pro life, but that's here nor there. But just because we had that topic of discussion, that came up at my termination that, you know, that I was a problem because I didn't agree <laughs> or something along those lines. When it came up, when I was talking about one of these guys, they're like, what's the problem with me? Well, we had this conversation about this and he didn't agree with it. <laughs> I'm like, what does that got to do with my job, man? You know, so that's the kind of stuff I was dealing with. I got tested 17 times. Well, first of all, before I started getting tested, I went home. They, they sent me home that day because I got a, it was a Saturday and they sent me home. And I was like, I was very, very emotional. And um, I was crying because I was like, 
I am going to lose my life. Here, this is my life. I am a fireman. I worked so hard to get here and to maintain it. And I've earned my way here. I've got the seat at the table, man. And th- that old saying where they tell you, it's, it's once you get it, it's yours to lose. <laughs> no, they can take it from you too. You know, it's not that, not that vigilant, you know, or vigilant. Um, so I go home. <sighs> this was, this was this, the, the, on my wrist, uh, for people who can't see, I have a, a, a my, my, my beads, um, that I learned from. Warriors Ascent uh, with the beads, um, prayer beads, meditation beads. Um, I, a, 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 I affixed on them a jewelry, little like uh, trinkets, and I have my forty-five hollow point. I have a cross. I have a nine millimeter. It was a hollow point. Hollow point fell off, and I got a, um, um, what's that called? Um, the uh, continue sign. The uh, colon, semicolon. Semicolon. The yeah. semicolon right? for continuing. A lot of people get that tattooed who have uh, attempted suicide. Because it means to continue on instead of ending the story, right? Right. So um, here I am, <laughs> I'm back home, and it's Saturday, and my mom's still at work, and it's just me and her living in the house, and I'm sitting there going, ah, "I'm gonna, uh, I'm done, I'm done." Now this is my second attempt. The first was in the Navy, and now this is three years after Nikki passed, and. Uh, I want to say something to you, but the very last words I had with my wife in the hospital, the very last words she spoke to me were, don't be selfish, babe. And I was like, when have you ever known me to be selfish? She's like, just don't be selfish, baby. And then she, that was it. She was asleep. And the next day I took her off here and she died. So, and we had the I love yous and all that stuff beforehand. Everybody got to say their piece to her for several days before she passed. But that, that was the last word she spoke on this earth to me. And um, <laughs> so here I am. Um, Got a bottle of whiskey um, that I've, I've had for years because I didn't drink. <laughs> so I gave a gift and I poured some in a glass, took a couple of shots, got my 45, popped it in my mouth, had the hammer back, had my thumb on the, on the trigger. Just three pounds of pressure, brother. It's over. You know, and uh, I don't know. I remember you telling your story. Gun metal has a taste when it's in your mouth. And... I'll never forget that. But as I'm sitting there ready to pull that trigger, I have a vision, a, 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 a flashback of 10 years prior, me walking upstairs. We used to watch this morning radio, morning, morning routine, you know, morning uh, news. And uh, our, one of our local weathermen here, um, he had committed suicide. And uh, we, we, everybody knew him and loved him, you know. And my wife's standing in front of the TV and I walk in and she's got a tear running down her face. I said, what's wrong? She goes, oh. So-and-so just killed himself. What a selfish thing to do. <laughs> that, on her deathbed, she's telling me not to be selfish. And three years later, I got a gun in my mouth. And I'm envisioning, envisioning her saying that about this man. I put the gun down. I put the whiskey away. And I grabbed my streets. And I started studying more. I told my friend who I worked with before, who was a former lieutenant of mine, about how I'm going to be okay. Nikki saved me, and this is how. I put him in a position. He had to say something. So I got put before the city psychiatrist, 30 days FMLA. When I come back, because they wanted me on a certain amount of drugs for a certain amount of time, when I come back and go to duty, here starts the testing. 17 tests in the next two months, three months, um, pump operating streets, having to pull up to the, uh, the streets were 10 addresses. I had to go to 10 addresses, no assistance from the MDT, no cell phone, no nothing. I give you an address, you drive to it. You have to be within one block of it in order to pass. You're only allowed to miss two on this because there's 10. You got to score 80. 10 for 10, 10 for 10, 10 for 10. And the last time I got tested, I was six times they ran me through that test. The last one, the proctor changed, and the proctor was a friend of mine. He turned the MDT away from me, and he'd punch in. He goes, give me a second, and he'd punch in the next address. I took us exactly how the MDT wanted us to go. He was so impressed. I'd just been down and dirty with it, man. Um, pump operations. I went out and did a pump operation test on the engine first time, and this is where another friend of mine at the department was there handling hoses and stuff. He was getting ready to retire. Um, he noticed that 
they were putting me through a ringer. They put me through 17 evolutions, 17 evolutions. No, I'm sorry. There were 17 tests, 19 evolutions on that engine test that day. And the only two that I was slow at was drafting and um, yeah, because we use that so much in right. metropolitan fire departments. Right, was was drafting and relay pumping. I I got it done. Now, mind you, I hadn't done either one of those in like three years, and we don't train on that regularly because um, there's not really a necessity for it. But we should probably train on it all the time. Should train on <laughs> relay pumping for yeah. sure. Yeah. But yeah, uh, well, drafting relay yeah. pumping they did train on. Yeah, but drafting we didn't yeah. train on. But but I but I got it done. And and I still I pass. I mean, goddamn, I got you know. If you want to count, don't knock those two off. I got seventeen out of nineteen. <laughs> it's pretty good. Well, one of the guys that was there operating the hose and stuff. So he noticed this, and as he called me, start recording everything. What do you mean? I see what they're doing to you. Start recording everything. They're putting you through shit that they didn't put nobody else through. That's not the pump test. When they told, because I said it wasn't. I was, this is pretty excessive, guys. Because to. to Every class that I went to, because I went to two other, that's not what we, that's not the final test, <laughs> what you put yeah. me through. And I still passed. So it's like, okay. Um, so then in another one, that Quint that I had worked on before, same Quint, um, I was adjusting for it because it still hadn't been fixed. It hadn't been repaired. So I was adjusting the lines pressures because they have to be at 100 PSI on the preset. Well, the preset wasn't working. So I was adjusting the um um, pumps to be able to allow that because it has to be 100 psi at the end of the hose. Well, I was being questioned by that lieutenant. Why are you doing that? I go because the 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 auto auto feed or the auto whatever is not working. It hasn't it's been reported last year. Yeah. Um. Not ding me, ding me. Failed those two tests. I'm like, how can you fail me on that? And they even had another person come in, another um, female operator who was there, and I brought her and another guy. I said, hey, this is what happened today. How would you adjust this? And they're like, I don't know. Uh, this is what I did. And I even went to the instructor who instructed me, hey, on the phone, this is what I'm doing. And that's what I would do. <laughs> okay, okay, cool. Thanks. So I recorded everything. And I did record her because I took her back out because what happened was I failed the test because they put her on the pump too, put me on the hose and put her on the pump. And then when we got back to the station, I asked her, I go, how'd that go? How'd, how'd the pump operate for you? She goes, I did, what you, I did what you told me to do and it worked. Okay. Well, I went into the meeting and they go, well, good news and bad news. You passed your driver's test, you know, the address test, but you failed your pump test. I did. Because yeah, um, she was able to do it without any adjustments. You weren't. Really? So I grabbed her after the meeting and took her out to the bay and I recorded it. I said, can you show me what you did on the pump? I did this, this, and this, and I wouldn't have known to do it. I've been doing this for nine years. I wouldn't have known to do it had you not told me. Okay, thank you. She goes, why? I go, because he said this about you and why would he say that? I don't know. Because I don't know what you're going I'm sorry you're going through what you're going through. Okay. Why lie? <laughs> so that started happening and happening. Next thing I know, um, I end up in, I, I finally get done with the testing. Um, they, they, they say, how about we, we test you one more time on the engine again since the Quint seems to have issues. Okay, no problem. I tested on it. It scored like a 92 or something according to the percentages. Um, but I got dinged on the fact that I'm sitting in, the engine and he's like, uh, what's that uh, um, interlock, you know, for the uh, differential lock, lock the differential button. Well, it's kind of like you know putting it in four wheel drive in a way. You push the button so you can turn all the wheels together and stuff, and so that way the limited slip doesn't kick in. You know, if you're on a slick surface or stuck in the mud or something like that. He goes, no, it's for connect. It's for connecting the differential. That's what I'm saying. It's just like it's, it's the kinda, same it's, fucking. It, it, thing. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, dude. It's like <laughs> I got dinged. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? But I still pass. I was like, whatever. And so I'm like, good. Go back to the station. They're like, hey, uh, good news. You passed everything. Great. Bad news is we're putting you on paid administrative leave. You're suspending me? Why? You're not allowed to talk to anybody. You need to leave. The only people you can talk to is this deputy chief and this um, battalion chief. That's it. We will let you know when there's going to be a meeting with the chief. The next week. So, okay. Go home. Right, I go out to the I go out to the bay, go grab my stuff. Now I'm on my I'm grabbing my helmet. I'm grabbing everything. I'm gonna grab everything I need to take with me because I know I'm probably never coming back. So I grabbed what I did and uh and there was one guy out there in the bay and he's like, What's going on? Well I guess I'm going home. Um they're kinda giving me some leave some time off for a little bit, so I'll see you later. I spoke to him. That came up later in the investigation. <laughs> during my appeal process 
Um, now, mind you, because I'm being told I can't speak to anybody on shift, that means I can't speak to my union rep or my union president. <laughs> Kansas, <laughs> great state, doesn't recognize unions. That's awesome. That's something else I would love to see get changed. So long story short, I end up in front of the man, a whole bunch of bullshit. A lot of stuff was said. I can get into a lot of details with that, but it's not worth it. I don't have time. Um, yeah, we need to start wrapping it up. Wrapping it up. Yeah. Um, so anyways, I end up um, getting a choice that I need to be either terminated or, or resign. And I was like, I'm not resigning. I didn't do anything to be resigned for. So I got terminated, ended up doing a, putting in a lawsuit. And um, lawsuit got settled four years later. Um, I can't talk about it you know, about what was settled for, what was not. I don't mention names of anybody because I'm not allowed to talk about it. But um, I can say this. Um, I still lost. I still lost. I did not gain anything. The only thing I was able to to do was show that I wasn't going to go down without a fight. Yeah. And that's it. Um, bottom line, uh, through everything that I've been through, um, the COE saved my life. It, it helped me realize and, and look in the mirror and see what I was doing wrong. I was being selfish there too. I wasn't uh, putting my kids first. I wasn't putting anybody else first. I was putting my own emotions first and how I, sub- how I subdued those emotions was through sex and womanizing. And I dated several women. Um, I, was, I did for them good things. I, I tried to treat them well. They weren't my wife. I compared them to my, that it was wrong. I used them for what I could use them for as they did me too, because I was dealing with other codependents and we, we each had our parts to play in this, but I, I, I reached out for amends. Uh, I realized I was wrong and I, I didn't like who I was. So that was the hardest part looking in the mirror going, man, this is not you. This is not who you are to the core. You're better than this. Um, so I had to forgive myself and then I had to ask for forgiveness. Not everybody forgives me. And that's okay. I can't force anybody to forgive me. No. But I could try to ask for it, and that's all I could do. And since then, brother, I have been in counseling, um, dealing with counseling. I've learned everything from the cognitive behavioral therapy processes we learned, the radical acceptance we learned, the techniques to stop, the breathe, you know, process and proceed, and those things, observe and all that stuff. It's truly helped me. I, I, I put them into effect to continue to help me. Um, I ended up retiring. I was able to qualify for a retirement. Um, through complex PTSD. And so I get 50% of my retirement, which wasn't much because I wasn't even vested yet because on the that side of the state line, it's 15 years get vested, which I think needs to be changed because in this industry, we can't do more than five years, man, without, I mean, you need to be vested after five years because chances are you might not be able to do 10 or 15 or 20 because of the way the job is. But at least, at least then if you'll have vested, you'll have something when you're 65 to pull from and um, and then continue to do another career, but that way that time's not wasted, you know? Yeah. But, um, so that, that's where I'm at. I'd like to try and get things rolling there. Um, I appreciate everything. Uh, if I could tell anybody, uh, I was at my rock bottom, I was going to end my life and thank God I didn't. I've survived all my worst days. Um, I, 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 I believe everything happened for a reason. Uh, the synchronicity of it all, um, even with my friend's death in his death, he saved mine life because I didn't want to do to my family what happened with, with his. And so here I am and and I'm working on, now I'm involved with the um, 1033 program. I'm getting training and stuff and getting involved with them. I would really love for you guys, if you haven't already had them on, because I haven't watched every episode, but um, we can probably get in contact with them. It's a, uh, I heard you over talking about smaller departments earlier. Um, It's really geared towards helping the smaller departments who don't have peer support and whatnot for us to be able to go out and, and be a peer and just support. We don't counsel because we're not counselors, but we can listen and you know, I know what you're going through. I can share my story with somebody and I can share with them how I got my help and how it helped me. And maybe that plants a seed into another fireman or police officer, whoever is in crisis to maybe take that step instead of ending their life. Cause that's the ultimate thing here is to stop and let's, let's stop the, the guys killing themselves. Absolutely. That's why we started the podcast. Right. So, right. James, closing thoughts. This is it. I, I want to go home. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, man. <laughs> Damn. You know, it's it's interesting, and of course, you've been through so many, so a lot of different programs, especially with the Center of Excellence. You know, and hearing you talk about it and what I know about, it's very similar to the same to programs Jeremy and I have went through with the same head guy, and it's 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 interesting when you look back on it. But one of the things you know he always talked about was. 
you know, you can't be held necessarily accountable for things you didn't know. And, and it's as a kid, and, and I don't know what episode you've watched with me, but like Jeremy knows all my story. Like childhood trauma is rough. And for some reason, all of us are like, let's go help other people without ever actually healing right. on our own. And, you know, and it's hard that to, to go into these careers without a solid base. And then we just compound and compound and compound. And we, at some point we wonder, somebody says, what's wrong with you? Well, do you got three and a half hours to sit down? At least let me give you the damn cliff notes. Right. Like, before, like we, right now. before we ever even get into it. And it's, right. and it's so hard, but I, I love, and I hope other people just, even if they're a little bit empowered, just to know that there are like, no matter how shitty this journey gets, there is another side to it. Absolutely. Absolutely. You, you always have a better day ahead. It may not, it may seem dismal. I, I, I was, when I was at my rock bottom, I was just there, just all the people that we hadn't saved and we tried to save, my wife included, because I was supposed to save her, man. You know, uh, I had no control over that. Uh, it, it just all came pouring down at once. And, and you got to realize it and know, and just deep down that. It's going to suck. It's going to hurt, but just keep moving forward. There was that great scene in, in the last Rocky movie or one of the Rocky movies where he talks to his son and says, you know, life, it, it, nothing's going to hit you harder than life and it'll hit you and put you down and keep you down if you let it. You just got to keep getting up and moving forward. And it's not about how hard you hit. It's about how, how hard you can take the hits, you know, and keep moving forward. Mm-hmm. And and that was a God. He he writes such good stuff, man. And even though he's crazy, but he's awesome. <laughs> uh, but so, but th- that's the whole thing. I uh, one thing I really want, want to say real quick is that I listen to a lot of podcasts. I I listen to I read a lot or listen to a lot of audio books. The Body Keeps the Score, man. That's a that's a that's a must read for everybody dealing with PTSD or or any kind of trauma. Um, the uh, there's a, de- a gentleman who's a first responder who actually was at the uh, COE. I think about six months to a year before me, and he was on a, a podcast of uh, Andy Stump's podcast, Cleared Hot. A um, bunch of the podcasts I listen to are a bunch of former Navy SEALs or Green Berets and stuff because they talk about, they're talking about their allegiance to save guys from killing themselves and their treatments and dealing with PTSD and all that. Um, th- there's a deal, deal uh, Flame and Fortune by Rick Bucher. Um, he was an yeah, alumni. We know? had him on the show. Okay, great. Yeah, he's awesome. He's doing, he's doing what I want to do. I feel like the, I feel like that's what I'm going to end up doing is traveling around a little bit, helping other. I don't want to be able to go to different departments since I am retired, and I'm I'm, I'm going to be able to do something like that as long as the finances are enough. But I would like to be able to travel around and and, and share my story a bit. Probably get it down in some shorter version or some stuff. It's like <laughs> the very first time I ever talked about this, but try and yeah. get some streamlined and yeah. uh, be able to pass on the mass pass on the message that um that it's a dark day, but there's always a bright day next. I mean, it, it truly that's true. Yeah, it, it truly is. Yeah, it's for sure, man. I yeah. mean, and that's, like you said, that speech from Rocky is, it's so poignant and it's so true that if you let life and all of the things that we go through, just in general, you take the fire service out of it. Right. And if you let it keep you in a place, it will. Right. You got to get up and you got to keep moving forward. Right. Right. So. The the thing, one thing too, I, I, I gave you, I did the first four chapters I had done so far. I let you read it and stuff. Yeah. Um, I did that to another friend of mine who's a BC up north in, in Wisconsin um, area. And I asked him, what'd you think? He goes, I'm angry. And I go, you are? What did I do? Did I write it wrong? What'd I do? He's like, <laughs> he's like no, brother, I'm angry for you because of everything you've been through so far. And he goes, it makes me wonder. He goes, I, I had a great childhood. I had a great life. Uh, and he's a great fireman. He's been doing it for years and years, you know, 30 plus years. And he's like, I wonder how many people in the fire service have a traumatic life, a childhood and life. And I was like, brother, you're one of the few I know that's had a good one. Yeah. That was healthy. And I think we do that as first responders because as we're being victimized or we're going through those traumatic uh, times of our life, we want to prevent others from having to experience that. Or we, or also possibly once we get older and we start realizing this is someone else's emergency, I can focus on it and not worry about mine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't disagree with that assessment. Not at all. Yeah. So it does seem like, you know, a lot of us have went through stuff in the past and that kind of steers you towards these and whether it's for whatever reason, I'm sure everybody has a different like 
reason or whatever, but, you know, to get some sense of control or, you know, I'm going to prevent this from happening to somebody else, or I'm going to help somebody else get Mm -hmm. through this or whatever it may be. Yeah, I definitely a hundred percent agree with that. And which (laughs) unfortunately you stack all of the job trauma on top of all that stuff. Right. You're just setting yourself up for failure. Right. Um, I'll have a closing thought. Go for it. Um, what I would like to see happen, if we can, um, is the officer ships, the 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 uh, lieutenants, the captains of the departments out there. I would, I think it would be very beneficial if they were able to go to a warrior's ascent week, even if they don't need it, but just so when they walk out of that. And that knowledge, that understanding, and what's been what's been taught about the brain, how it works, emotions. You could you could probably be able to monitor your crew and see the signs and things beforehand to be able to pull them aside and say, "Hey, oh, what's up?" or "Let's work on this," to try and help that stigma. Um, that's one aspect of it. The other aspect I have of it, and this is sometimes frowned upon, but here the bottom line is, I want to save a life if I can. Um, if uh, I urge some young people, if they're at certain departments. You know, sometimes peer support isn't so confidential, and unfortunately. Um, so what you might want to do if you're a young fireman out there or, or even an older one and just finally starting to hit the fan, man, um, maybe uh, think about keeping it to yourself. I know that's unhealthy advice, but it's not unhealthy advice when I finish it. Keep it to yourself at your station, but get the help you need outside of your department with another department or somebody who works for another department, um, the 1033 program, um, call you guys, you guys can direct in other places. Because for me, until the stigma really does get more accepted right now, I think some of these guys' best interest to save their careers or stop from getting eight balled or black balled, you know, um, would be handle it. It's going to happen. Handle it. Get your counseling. You might even have to pay out of pocket for it if you want to keep it to yourself. But then you, you deal with it, you get that PTSI, which is to me that's post traumatic injury, not not a freaking syndrome, and you can get rehabilitated and you get back to work and you'll be fine. You know, um, that's one aspect of it. Take it or leave it. I just feel like no matter what, I just want to somehow help other guys get through their 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 ordeals and stay on the job. I would have liked to have stayed on the job, um, or be able to leave the job and know that there's other things to do outside of being a fireman. And a rescue where you can serve in other ways. And I found that with uh, 1033 and, and talking. And this is my year, 2024. I'm coming out. I'm going to finish my book. I'm going to get my podcast up. I'm going to have you on. <laughs> and and you both. <laughs> and I'm the brains of the operation. There you go. <laughs> and, I'm and, just the pretty face. <laughs> there you go. But this is it. This we is are my in year. trouble. <laughs> you, know, you know, Brian, something you said, too, that before we close up real quick, too, that I'm even going to kind of jump on you because, it, again, it shows the reactive culture that we are in the fire service. I would encourage, it's not a matter of whether these guys need a program or not, especially with like with Warriors of Sent, go anyway. Right. We're so reactive of, oh, now we need it. God forbid, mm-hmm. you know, we as a service just be proactive maybe, right. you know, or like go to learn ahead of time instead of learning how we deal with it, maybe learn how to react with it ahead of time. And it's, I, I would encourage that, you know, Jeremy, you're, a, and you know, a captain now too, like. Everybody, just go learn these things before we have to. It's so much easier to do it on our own time than it is to do it. Absolutely. Well, I mean, this is my own personal opinion, but if you're going to promote into a leadership role, you have to do that kind of stuff. It's your responsibility because ultimately I'm responsible whenever I am on a crew, I'm responsible for those individuals. Absolutely. That's my job. Yeah. Yeah. So we're not in the Boy Scouts here, man. We're not earning yeah. merit badges. This this job is life and death. And guess what? Fire at your district is just as dangerous as fire in New York City. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I I don't know. There's a lot. There's a lot that I would like to see um, in the fire service about leadership, and that is one of the things um, that I think needs to be addressed. Yeah. So I think right now, well, as of two years ago, when I was around the campfire at the COE, it was about an 80 20. 80% of them were um, departments did not support this kind of thing. And most likely, those guys are going to lose their job when they got home. Um, and the 20% were they were sent by their department and they were waiting for them to get home so they could send the next guy. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And it's, I think it's probably a little bit better split now, but it's still not where it needs to be. As in, so. Absolutely. All right, man. 
Thank you. Thanks for coming. I appreciate it. Um, yes. Look forward to having you on again and look forward to whenever you get your podcast going, we'll, right. we'll come and hang definitely out. Have to, when I finish the book, I'll definitely have to have you have me on. <laughs> oh, absolutely, man. Yeah. We can, we can record it here, like do the audio. Do the audio book? <laughs> audio book. Yeah. I seriously want to do the audio book with my own voice, but I, I always, I kind of wonder how it would go because I get emotional. <laughs> hey, that's uh, it. Lends gravitas to it. That's true. So. That's true. We'll see how it goes. Thank All you right. so much, guys. Thank you so much. This is my first time, and I, I was nervous as hell. <laughs> but you guys, you guys made me feel comfortable, and uh, thank you so much for this opportunity and uh, kicking my ass in the in the gear. Well, hey, love having you here, man. Thank so you. Appreciate it. Thank you. So. All right, everybody. Uh, thanks, Brian, for coming on the show. Thanks, James. He was actually early today. For those of you keeping score. <laughs> Um, yeah. by one minute, but still that's early. Um, <laughs> so yeah, look, if you're struggling, reach out. There are resources out there. If you know somebody that's struggling, reach out to them, let them know that you care, let them know what the resources are in your area. Right. Um, if you don't know what the resources are, we got to email, email us, you know, we'll, if we don't know, we'll find out. So, um, yeah. So thanks for stopping by and we'll see you next time. <laughs>